Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, C3 uh, 2020 in partnership with a five continent uh, Congress and uh, Great Wall Congress in Beijing, China uh, is uh, very delighted uh, to invite all the participants from US as well as uh, China uh, on our first in the series of uh, virtual uh, in a structural heart interventions. And we have a fantastic uh, program uh, in uh, store uh, for everyone. First of all, I wanna thank uh, our brave doctors and nurses and first responders uh, throughout the uh, United States and the rest of the world who are fighting uh, really hard uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, there are people making a huge amount of sacrifices to do, fight this uh, pandemic uh, and uh, we thank them. And I pray to God to heal our nation and the world and renew hope in everyone uh, who is suffering and once again uh, uh, light the uh, fire uh, 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 of education in our uh, great profession and our fraternity. Uh, I want to uh, invite uh, and welcome uh, my co-chairs, uh, Dr. Yuji Zhao, uh, Dr. Jian and Wang, uh, Dr. Yong Jian Wu uh, from China uh, to uh, share uh, this session. I also want to welcome all our moderators, including uh, Dr. Lars Sondergaard, uh, Pradeep Yadav, uh, Pinak Shah, Matt Cavender, Wai Lu, Didi Wang, Toby Rogers, Keith Allen, uh, Dr. Artizani, and uh, Jim Harvey uh, to participate uh, in the uh, discussion. Uh, let me uh, uh, now uh, go ahead and uh, invite uh, our uh, Dr. Zhao, you want to say uh, something in, on behalf of the Five uh, Continent Congress? Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Dewey, to organize uh, the present C3 committee to uh, organize this uh, very uh, special time, very special uh, session. Uh, in the China, my many doctors uh, to uh, join us uh, this uh, session online. Oh, I think uh, over uh, 10,000 uh, the, the doctor, maybe. So uh, the five young uh, doctor, the translator uh, of the topic. So uh, uh, thank you everybody, uh, everyone in join us. Thank you very much. This is a wonderful the topic. So especially in the, the Tari, the technique, the very special experience uh, advance uh, the technique and uh, uh, to have a benefit in the China uh, development in this uh, field. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's, uh, that's great. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, Zhao, uh, for that uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And uh, good evening to all the um, uh, 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 participants in China. Uh, who is taking the time out of their very, very busy schedule to be with us. Uh, so let's uh, get started. Uh, let me just see if uh, Dr. Lars Sondergaard has uh, joined in. Um, Lars, can you hear us? Okay, so we'll um, uh, keep uh, uh, moving until uh, Lars uh, uh, figures it out uh, how to uh, join us. Uh, but uh, in, in today's uh, 2020, who should still uh, get sour? Uh, it's a great pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Keith Allen uh, from uh, Kansas, who is a well-known uh, cardiovascular uh, surgeon uh, and, and has uh, taken a tremendous um, uh, has been uh, doing a lot of research in the in the valvular disease area, and he will uh, talk about uh, first uh, who should uh, get um, SAVAR procedure in uh, 2020. Great, thank you all very much. Now let me see if I can make this uh, work. Screen share. Yeah, can you guys see that? I see you, we don't see your computer screen yet. All right. Should be a thing at the bottom. I would be able to do it also for you. How about now? I'm pressing screen share, so. 
about there? Yes, we see it now. Perfect. Okay, great. Let me go see if I can go to full screen here. Maybe. Might not let me. You guys can see that, okay? Yeah, we see perfect. If you just uh, use like a normal PowerPoint, it'll work just fine. So <laughs> there you are. Perfect. All right. Thank you for, I, I always need a cardiologist to guide me. <laughs> These are my disclosures. I think we're all familiar with the wealth of data that's come out of transcatheter valve therapies over the last really 10 years. And when you look at uh, inoperable patients, high risk, intermediate, and now low risk, uh, you know, clearly TAVR uh, is, in my opinion as a surgeon, the go-to treatment for certainly isolated uh, aortic stenosis. And I think based on all of that data, uh, we might want to have a moment of silence for SAVR. Is surgical aortic valve replacement dead and should we let it rest in peace? Kraken has clearly been released. All of the trials point towards good success with TAVR compared to surgery. But I think we do need to pause a bit and uh, realize that there are a lot of unanswered questions still revolving around TAVR such as the durability of these valves in younger patients, not low-risk patients, but younger patients, the effect that uh, AI might have on longer life expectancy. How does permanent pacemaker rates uh, impact particularly longevity and, and quality of life in younger patients? Valve and valve remains uh, a quagmire that's got a lot of unanswered questions, subclinical leaflet thrombosis, and then bicuspids. So there's a lot of issues that still swirl around TAVR. We're not gonna be able to talk about all of those obviously in this talk, but we're gonna to touch on some of these that might make surgery in certain patients more desirable than TAVR. I think we're very familiar with the two seminal talks uh, given at the ACC last year on low risk. Uh, but I think the key slide in that presentation is the exclusion criteria uh, for who we actually studied TAVR in. And when you look at the exclusion list, it included such things as bicuspid, patients that had severe calcification in the LVOT, and patients that had complex coronary artery disease. And these were, there were similar exclusions uh, presented in the Medtronic low-risk trial. And in fact, if you look at the Partner 3 data, one-third, 520 patients out of the 1,520 patients screened worldwide were excluded from this trial because of anatomic reasons. We can't forget that this was a very select group of patients that was studied for TAVR. And I think now our mantra, at least at the Mid-America Heart Institute for who should get TAVR versus surgery is really driven solely not by risk anymore, but it's driven by anatomic considerations that might point to a better result with TAVR or SAVR. And I think I'd like to editorialize just for a moment and say that it's a dangerous heart team that has a surgeon sitting in the corner, unengaged and pouting because SAVR is not as frequently performed as it used to be, but it's equally dangerous to have a cardiologist who is in disbelief that there's any problems with TAVR and who doesn't think surgery still plays a role in, uh, in helping patients uh, get a good result. Let's talk about durability of these transcatheter valves. And I think a lot of people kind of say now the durability issue is put to rest. We've got five, six, seven year data, but the reality is those are in very older patients. And in fact, most of the patients uh, in some of the early trials are long dead and gone. And we don't actually have good durability data on transcatheter valves, particularly in younger patients. You can't forget that the average age in partner one and two was over 80. The average age in the low risk trial was 73. How these valves are gonna behave in 40, 50, 60 year olds is really unknown. I think we clearly know 
that surgical valve durability is very age dependent with the risk of failure increasing with the younger age. And in fact, that failure curve begins uh, at about seven to 10 years after implantation, but it precipitously drops off if you're less than 60 years old. And I think it would be naive of us to think that tissue transcatheter heart valves will behave differently than surgical tissue valves with regard to durability. I think we uh, would be wise to follow Churchill's example that those who fail to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. I think it's important that we don't neglect uh, the benefits of mechanical valves in certain patients. There's a tsunami of uh, interest in just implanting tissue valves, but I think that mechanical valves, both in the aortic and certainly in the mitral position, still and should play an important role in treating these patients. Obviously, we're all familiar with the conundrum of durability and hemodynamics favoring the tissue valve with bleeding and thromboembolism, the Achilles heel of mechanical valves. I would point you to this very nice article in the New England Journal by Wu and his yeah. group that looked yeah. at aortic and mitral valve replacement comparing mechanical and biological mm. prostheses. Yeah. And of about 10,000 patients undergoing aortic valve surgery in California, biological prostheses was associated with a higher 15 year mortality compared to mechanical prosthesis in patients 45 to 54 years of age. And in fact, the sweet spot for when that mortality benefit seemed to dissipate was at about at age 55. So I think surgeons need to, as well as cardiologists need to think strongly about what their strategy is yeah. long-term for certain patients and how they're going to manage them. Bicuspids is an area where there remains a lot of enthusiasm for performing TAVR, but the reality is uh, these have not been studied in a rigorous fashion. Unfortunately, bicuspids are seen in the very group of patients that we don't have a lot of data on for TAVR. They're often seen in much younger patients. You in the, uh, they're also associated usually with significant uh, LVH, He's also a child of this, you know. Which increases the risk play. of PVI. It's also often associated with aortopathy yeah. that uh, requires intervention that can't be treated percutaneously. I think the most important piece of this is that we don't have good rigorous data on TAVR in a bicuspid valve, and surgery still is going to play an important role in this population. I think probably the, the seminal paper, Raj's paper uh, out of Cedars, where they looked at outcomes in a balloon expandable sapien valves in bicuspid patients using the STS ACC registry, but we don't, can't forget that within this registry study, once again, the average age is not young. It's 73 years old. We also have to understand that this is registry data with particularly poor echo and CT analysis and an incredibly strong selection bias uh, favoring TAVR as only patients felt to have favorable anatomy uh, with bicuspid pathology actually got TAVR. When we actually do look at the paper and you compare TAVR in bicuspid versus tricuspid, there's a higher risk of stroke and a higher risk of new pacemaker and a higher trend toward perivabular leak. Obviously, this is comparing TAVR to itself, but surgery negates some of these issues. And I think it needs to be held out, particularly- Let's keep in touch on this. Uh, with uh, heavy I mean, you have my full commitment to, to the meeting. Uh, I just want to- um... I think we all would like to uh, move like Mick Jagger. And here you see him six weeks after his tavern in New York. Uh, yeah, but again, but I, I mean, remind uh, everybody of a famous headline now, in Variety uh, magazine in 1995 that said rock and roll will be gone by June, that it's and, a passing uh, fad. And I would argue that Saver is going to decline, but it's certainly not dead.
I'll leave you with this last snippet from uh, Monty Python, and you decide who the surgeon and who the cardiologist is. I think surgery still will continue to play an important role in select populations, but there's no question that CAVR is uh, uh, ruling the roost at the present time. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, uh, Keith. Uh, that was a very nice uh, presentation and an excellent uh, summary of uh, what our current uh, data tells us about uh, uh, whether uh, we should um, uh, do uh, SAVAR versus TAVAR in a different uh, patient population. So to, to continue the discussion further in the interest of the time, uh, now uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lars Sondergaard uh, has uh, joined us. Yeah, hello everyone. Hi Lars, how are you doing? I'm fine, thanks. Good. So Dr. Sondergaard uh, is a very well-known uh, structural heart interventionalist worldwide. He's a professor of cardiology at the University of Copenhagen uh, since uh, 2015. Uh, he has one of the largest uh, structural heart program at the Riggs Hospital in uh, Copenhagen. Uh, he was supposed to be our um, uh, keynote speaker at uh, this year's C3 in the structural uh, program. Uh, but you know, we welcome you uh, uh, virtually today. Uh, hopefully, we will have uh, honor to have your presence uh, in 2021. Uh, he's been a, a live case operator for thousands of uh, conferences and uh, has been a, um, uh, a principal investigator and first uh, implanter of many uh, innovative devices. So today, he's going to talk to us about the new TAVAR uh, frontiers in low-risk uh, asymptomatic patients and a moderate aortic stenosis. To you, Lars. Thank you. Let's see if I can share my screen with you. Can you see my screen now? Uh, not yet. No slides. Yeah, I see. Okay. So thank you for the invitation to talk about um, what could be um, the new future for, for transcatheter aortic valve replacement patient at what we call low risk. We can come back to that term and also maybe expanding it to patients who still have no symptoms despite severe aortic stenosis and patients who have moderate aortic stenosis on the top of heart failure. So these are my conflict of interest. So you know that TAVI has probably been um, one of the most evidence-based uh, therapies within the cardiology. We have seen trials on patients at extreme risk showing it's superior to best medical treatment, patient at high surgical risk, patient at intermediate surgical risk. And just a year ago, we saw the two low risk trials presented. Partner tree from Edwards, 1000 patients treated with sapien tree or surgical aortic valve replacement, having a little bit, um, how you can say, untraditional primary endpoint of all cause mortality, disabling stroke and rehospitalization, which was valve related. And using that, it can show that at one year, TAVA was superior to surgery. The Medtronic Evolute Low Risk Trial was a little bit more rigorous conducted. It had only death and disabling stroke as a primary endpoint. And at two years, it was not inferior to surgery, including 1,400 patients. So, and also this was a meta-analysis we did on the seven randomized trials conducted today between TAVA and surgical aortic valve replacement. It's 8,000 patients. And if you look at all cause mortality at two years, you can see that if the patient went for a TAVA procedure, there was a reduction of 12%. And for the patient who actually was randomized to a transfemoral approach, it was actually 17% reduction in all cause mortality at two years. So clearly there was a mortality benefit to, to go for TAVA. Also, if you look at the stroke rate at two years, again, large cohort of patients, 8,000 patients. So a reduction of 19% for patient who's going for a transcatheter instead of a surgical aortic valve replacement. So very encouraging data. 
However, when you talk about these two low risk trials, there's one thing you have to keep in mind. These patients was highly neglected. And you can ask yourself, what did low risk mean? And of course, according to the study protocol, it means that the patient was at a low surgical risk. But also, if you go down to the supplement of these trials, particularly for the partner treat trial, you can see that it was also actually a patient who had a low risk for a sub -top, sub optimal outcome after a TAVI procedure. So that in order to be included, the patient needs to be suitable not only for a transfemoral access, but for safe transfemoral access. The coronary arteries need to have a high takeoff to reduce the risk of coronary obstruction. The patient needs to have a tricuspid aortic valve, not a bicuspid aortic valve. And there could be no severe calcification of the aortic valve complex. And there could be no calcification at all in the left ventricular after tract. So you have patient which everyone can do a, a successful TAVI and there was no borderline patient as we see in our normal practice. So keep that in mind. So not all patient who was, uh, no low risk patients was represented in this trial. And for some patient at a low surgical risk, TAVA may potentially be a better option than, SAVA may be a better option than transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And also when you talk about low risk patient, people think we're talking about younger patient, but the patient was still elderly patient who went into the, to the trial. So if you look at, again, all the seven randomized trials between surgery and transcatheter aortic valve replacement, you can see from the extreme risk with a very high STS score around 11 to 12% down to the two low risk trials with around 2% in, in STS score. So we have covered the whole spectrum of uh, risk scores. But here for the first five trials, the mean age was around 80 years. It came a little bit down for the two latest trials, but only to 75 years of age. And actually less than 20% of the patient was younger than 70%, or 70 years. So again, it, it may be patient at a low surgical risk, but it's still elderly patients who's been studied. And if you look what the surgeons are doing, these are data from, from Copenhagen, our institution. You can look in 2005 and 2006. If you look at the patient who had a mechanical valve, these are the black bars down here. And the patient who have a biprostatic surgical valve, that's a great bar. The age of break even at that time was 68 years. Less than 10 years later, it was down to 61 years. So more and more patient is actually going for a biprostatic surgical valve because the patient doesn't want to go on anticoagulation and also have the, pers the perspective that when the surgical valve is failing, we guys can put a TAVI valve into the, the fade valve. But again, instead of looking at patient at older age, we should look at patient at younger age. Patient who today go for a surgical biprostatic aortic valve, these patients could potentially be a candidate for TAVA instead of SAVA. So again, I think long, low risk is a very poor term. We shouldn't talk about low risk patient, but we should talk about patient with longer life expectancy. That's going to be a much more interesting question. And those patients are not covered so far in the trials we have seen. And if you go down to patient at a younger age, we're going to see the more patients will come forward with aortic stenosis based on a bicuspid aortic valve. And often these younger patients with bicuspid aortic valve is a different phenotype than the elderly patient with bicuspid aortic valve. It's often much more severely calcified valve with a higher, higher risk of uh, suboptimal outcomes. And again, remember, all the randomized trials between transcatheter and surgical aortic valve replacement have excluded patients with bicuspid aortic valve. So we, does, we do simply not know how transcatheter approach is doing compared to surgical approach to these valves. And you can have different kinds of bicuspid aortic valve. You can have a SIVAS type zero, type one, and type two. The most common is a type one, where you have one RAFA, and often that RAFA is calcified. And if you have a severe calcification of that RAFA, that stent frame is not going to expand to a circular config configuration, but going to be elliptical. And particularly if you have a transcatheter heart valve with an internal position of the leaflet and the stent frame is not circular, how is that going to affect the durability of these leaflets? 
is probably going to be impaired and going to have an earlier uh, uh, valve failure and need for re-intervention. So that also needs to be keep in, kept in mind when we're talking about patients with longer life expectancy who have a bicuspid aortic valve. What is the optimal treatment for these patients? And what about durability? It used to be very difficult to talk about durability. In the old days, the surgeons was classifying valve failure as a patient with a, with a biprosthetic valve who came for a re-intervention, but the patient who was not offered a re-intervention was not counted as a valve failure. Now we both in Europe and the US have consensus definition how to classify it. So we can talk about valve dysfunction or valve failure. And valve failure is defined by that the patient is undergoing a re-intervention, got a valve-related death, but got severe valve degeneration with a very high gradient, mean gradient more than 40 millimeter mercury, or a step up from baseline of at least 20 millimeter mercury. And applying these criteria here to the notion one, try using the old first generation core valve, we now have data at six years, and we can see at six years, there's no difference in valve failure. It's around 7% both after surgery and after transcatheter aortic valve replacement. But again, remember, six years is not a long time. So if you go to the surgical literature and find some of the surgical biprosthetic valve, which have a very poor durability, it's not used anymore, like the Toronto stentless valve, you can look at six years, everything, everything was looking fine, and then it starts to go squared. So before we can conclude that these transcatheter valves have the same durability as the best surgical biprosthetic valve, we need eight, 10, 12, maybe even 15 years uh, durability data. And of course, we're not going to get those data if you're not going to, use, to move to patients with longer durability, uh, with longer life expectancy. So just here to, to conclude on this uh, low risk uh, trials, be critical and not opportunistic about the evidence. It was highly selected elderly patient who went into the trials. And also short term outcome, one or two years may not be sufficient to support to using TAV in patients with much longer life expectancy. And I think it's very crucial now for the heart team, it's going to be a difficult decision to advise, to counsel these patients with longer durability, uh, with longer life expectancy, what will be the best treatment option? Is it going to be surgical or transcatheter aortic valve replacement? And Bill's valve are you going to use? I'm just going to slide, uh, briefly touch on um, the ongoing trials on, on patients with asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. As you know, there's an early TAVA trial going on. It's supported by ETVA, so it's a sapient tree valve. So, but again, remember that about, it's, it's driven by about one out of four patients who's undergoing valve replacement does not have any symptoms relief. So maybe we should intervene early on in these. And of course, it's going to be a balance about the effect and the risk of TAVA. And with a low complication rate we have today, I think we can justify it. And as you know, the long-term, uh, uh, the primary endpoint is going to be a comp composite endpoint of all-cause mortality, stroke, and unplanned cardiovascular hospitalization. Another trial which is going on is on patients with moderate aortic stenosis and heart failure. So it's going to see whether afterload reduction during a TAVA procedure is related with a better outcome, looking at the primary endpoint of all-cause mortality, disabling stroke, rehospitalization, and quality of life, TAVA unload, it's, it's also ongoing. But I think this is going to be a much more difficult study to actually show it's uh, beneficial because suboptimal TAVA may jeopardize the outcome. So if you end up with a severe patient prestigious mismatch, which you see in about 10% of the patients treated with a safe and tree, or if you have more than a mild parvalvular leak, or if you end with a permanent pacemaker, I think that's going to be a devastating complication for patients with heart failure. So I think I'm going to, to stop here and, and we, can, we can discuss it uh, from here. Thank you, uh, Lars. That was a uh, fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, we'll take a, a few minutes now to discuss as, uh, you know, Dr. both uh, Dr. Keith Allen and uh, uh, yourself have uh, talked uh, uh, very nicely about how uh, we should interpret uh, uh, some of the uh, current data and uh, how to uh, take into account uh, other uh, patient-related factors, including their life expectancy in uh, deciding 
uh, Tavar versus uh, Savar. So any panelists have uh, any um, uh, comments or questions for uh, Keith and, and Lars? Hi Raj, hey, this is this is uh, Benny Shaw. Good morning, everyone. Hi. Uh, Good morning. Just a question or just a, a perspective from both doctors Allen and Sondergaard. There's been uh, durability, obviously, is a huge concern. Uh, there's been a lot of interest in some of the core valve data. Uh, you know, looking at uh, a greater difference in mean gradients and valve areas compared to surgical aortic valves compared to what we might be seeing in the uh, in the uh, balloon expandable valves. And of course, uh, the two year data from partner uh, from ACC also raised some potential concerns uh, about uh, uh, increased halt rates and that sort of thing. So, I, you know, there's definitely some chatter out there that we may learn one day that the superannular self expanding design might give us a, a longer durability. And I'm interested in what, uh, what your thoughts are about that. Lars? Uh... Yeah. I mean, I think there's going to be many factors which is going to affect the durability. But I think one factor is how large opening area do you have after aortic valve replacement? So if you have a lower opening area, smaller opening area, it's probably going to fail early on. A simple concept is going to see that you're going to lose a part of your opening area every year. And the sooner you get to a critical point, then the valve is failed. So if you start at a higher level, as for the, as you said, self-expanding technology with the superannular, uh, leave the position, it's all probably going to take longer time before you reach that point. And I think what we have seen from the Notion trial, also from the Sotavi trial, and we have seen from the partner trials, it looks like the Corval platform have a better durability than uh, the self or the balloon expandable platform. But the, but the story is much more complex because you also have to take into account what is going to happen when the valve is failing. And I think what is going to happen is that we're going to offer this patient a TAVA in TAVA procedure. It's difficult to see these patients who have a very smooth, simple TAVA procedure at an early age, 10 years later when they're older, have more comorbidities, it's going to sign up for open heart surgery, maybe with root construction, reconstruction because of in of the stent frame. So this patient is going for a TAVA and TAVA procedure. That is going to be quite simple if you have a balloon expandable valve even though, of course, you're not going to increase your opening area more than the first one. But if you have a super annular position of the leaflet, those leaflets are going to be pushed aside. They're going to create a, a jail between the two stent frame and create a tunnel of tissue starting in the left ventricular alpha tract through the sinus of the salva and into the ST junction. So let's say the patient had his first tava when he was 60 years of age. He had his tava and tava when he was 70 years of age. He got 10, 15, maybe even 20 years of life expectancy. What are you going to do the day that patient is going to be admitted with acute coronary symptom? It's going to be very difficult or maybe impossible to get into these coronary arteries. So again, it's going to be a very complex decision which valve is actually best for the long-term strategy and also for a TAVA and TAVI uh, procedure later on. So we have a question from uh, Dimitrios uh, Nikas uh, from Greece, who is a very uh, uh, busy uh, interventional uh, cardiologist as well as structural interventionalist uh, in Thessaloniki. Uh, and uh, he says surgeons are using more and more uh, new self-expandable uh, bioprosthetic valves, so though surgically implanted with a mini thoracic lap. Any data on the durability of those valves? Maybe this is a good question for Keith. Yeah, so I, you know, the rapidly expanding valves, quite honestly, I, I, my personal opinion is that valves like Intuitive and Percival uh, miss their window of opportunity. Uh, the, the data, we don't have good durability on rapid expansion surgical implanted valves. Uh, we do know that they carry with them some components complications similar to TAVR, whether it's perivalvular leak or a little higher risk of pacemaker, uh, they do have the advantage of being able to debride the calcium and remove all of the calcification in the LVOT and the leaflet. But to be honest, saving uh, 10 or 15 minutes of cross clamp time, I don't believe uh, 
is going to drive people to have one of those valves through a small second inner space or a hemisternotomy uh, compared to TAVR. Those procedures, despite having the, the uh, nomenclature of minimally invasive, still are uh, thoracic surgical procedures. And we know when we look at TAVR done direct aortic or transapical, uh, the, the data in those populations doesn't look very good either. So I think taking it with just percutaneous TAVR I still think is gonna win out over the rapid expansion valves. And that's from a surgeon's perspective. Thank you. Uh, so in the interest of the time, we'll uh, keep moving forward. And it's a great privilege and, and honor to now invite uh, Dr. Jianan Wang. Uh, he is uh, a chief of cardiology and a professor uh, of medicine at uh, Zhejiang University and has really uh, converted his uh, department to a, a great uh, innovative center in uh, Hangzhou, uh, uh, China. Uh, he also runs a uh, Chinese uh, uh, wall meeting and uh, we're very honored to uh, have him with us today. And he's now going to talk about uh, bicuspid Val and Tavar, uh, the Chinese uh, perspective. So welcome uh, Dr. Jian and Wang. I can see your slides. I think you need to unmute. Yeah, I'm going to try to see if I can unmute him myself. Okay. Yeah. You may have to go off screen share to be able to see his unmute button. Please open your microphone. Okay, we can hear you now. Uh, Professor Wang is fixing the computer. Just a, a okay, sure. just one minute. Yeah, just no, one no minute. Problem. He's coming. Yeah. I don't know. I can share the. Yeah, we, can, we can see you. We can see your slides, and we can also hear you now. Here. Can you see my slides? I, hear now? I see. It. One. I hear you. I hear you. Can you see my slides? Yes. We yes. Can. Yes. Yes. I already. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, dear our friend, it's my great honor to share my presentation on the important uh, webinar uh, conference. So the title of my presentation is going to be Back Hospital War and uh, Tiver, especially uh, from a, a Chinese perspective. Uh, I'm going to touch uh, two field of uh, two field. The first one is the current status of Tiver in back, uh, in back hospital aortic stenosis. Then I'm going to talk about the innovation a strategy uh, in back, back hospital aortic stenosis type of procedure. Uh, as we know, the, in most of the clinical studies uh, until now, the back hospital are uh, excluded. Uh, even in the 2017, the ESC guideline, we still can say the uh, cyber is more favorable for bicuspid aortic valve stenosis. Uh, until now, most of clinical evidence coming from retrospective or case theory study, less the RCT uh, studies. Actually, I, I compare the uh, situation, different situation compared to Western countries, uh, uh, compared to Western countries with China. So in Western countries, it looks like more type one by cosmic aortic valve. And uh, usually they, from the clinical studies, we can see they meet a less, they meet a more patient with less classified uh, by cosmic uh, valve. Um, actually, uh, in current, not many, a few studies looks like 
and non-inferior to tricuspidal. But, uh, but most of procedures, they, they use a new generation type of de device. But back to China, we can say that we need more patients, more back hospital in our patient with type zero. So we have more patient with more severe classification. Uh, so <clears throat> in China, in, chi in China studies about type already we we include uh, back of the of our patients. So until now, there are in China, in whole China, there are only uh, first generation device on commercial. So, so our data, most data about the backups coming from the first generation device. So we can back, we can see the the study published announced on the ACC this year. So we can see that the uh, the the type zero is uh, is around only less than ten percent, but the uh, type one is more than seventy percent. So uh, looks like the population classification is quite different from China. Uh, we can see the data coming from China. We can see uh, in the Venus trial, almost 50% of patients with a bypass early virus diagnosis. In our center, until now, we've done more than 600 patients, around uh, less than 40% uh, uh, bypass early virus diagnosis. So compared with the population down in Western countries, uh, we have a much higher prevalence of, uh, we had a much higher population with bypass. So among those bypass the uh, ARD virus diagnosis patients, so we can say uh, uh, from our center, uh, type zero is uh, around 76%. Uh, from other data, looks like more than 50% of the uh, patients are type zero. Uh, compared with the Western countries, looks like we have more patients with the bypass among those, uh, uh, with type zero bypass among those backup aortic virus diagnosis. Uh, in China, we, we made more patients, we treat more patients with cover, those patients with a higher classified volume. So you can see the four studies coming from the China, it, uh, either the, the Northern China or Eastern or Western or China Taiwan. So all of four looks like the average of a classified score significantly higher than the the procedure done in Los Angeles for the Western population. Uh, challenges for the bypass the aortic virus diagnosis however, in Chinese population. Uh, first of all, absolutely, we need more the type zero. We have more patients with severe and classification and as asymmetric, especially not just severe, but your race asymmetric classification. Uh, the other challenge, big challenge is until now we don't have the new generation device, device on commercial. We only have a, a first generation device, but we treat the so severe uh, bypass ARD virus diagnosis patient. It's not so easy. Uh, second question I'm going to touch about the strategy in bypass ARD virus diagnosis uh, type of procedure. Uh, I'm going to uh, talk, uh, talk a little bit about uh, the strategy we designed uh, we, the, we, it's called the superannular structure uh, based on sizing strategy uh, for the bicuspid aortic virus diagnosis. Uh, <clears throat> actually, I, we named the strategy as a Hangzhou solution. So you know the Hangzhou is my hometown. So we use the Hangzhou as the, the, the name of the strategy. We call the Hangzhou solution. So we can see here, uh, usually when we do the vibrotomy of the aortic virus diagnosis, so we can see Usually above the annulus, especially for those patients with bypass and a severe calcified uh, leaflets. So we can see clearly there is a waste sign. So when we infla uh, infla uh, inflation of the balloon, so it looks like above the annular, there is a severe waste sign. So simultaneously, if we do the angiogram, for some cases, when you when you inflation of the balloon, uh, when you do the for most of cases, when you do the, if the balloon is big enough, simultaneously when you inflate the balloon, you do the angiogram, you didn't see any leaky, leaking. So it uh, means the superannular structure has a very good ceiling of the balloon. So the regular way we now we select the, our sizing strategy is based on the annular sizing on the CT scan. 
So usually for the, this kind of patients, we select the device usually is too big. So it's very easy. Everybody, uh, every good uh, operators, we know it's very hard to hold the device during the inflation. So usually this is quite com common phenomenon is diving a lot. So after diving may cause, it may cause severe regurgitation. So like the, the picture, I like the, the film I show you. But for some cases, if you, you, you want to achieve a good outcome, you may have a higher deployment uh, for those kind of patients, but uh, usually because of the maybe jump out. So it's a dangerous, so dangerous. So we think about the question because until now, there's no good device to be, to have strong evidence to open the supraannular, supranative leaflets. So if we, so we have to accept the phenomenon, we cannot totally open the native leaflets. So we have to accept the, the phenomenon. So you read the regular strategy, we, our setting strategy is based on the annular. So most, for most of patients with a so severe classifier leaflets, you already you select two big sites. So we, but now we measure the supraannular sites uh, based on the bronchitis strategy. So you can see here, so during the inflation of the balloon, we do the simultaneous angiogram. We, we measure the, the size of the waist. Then we make ju judgment how big size the, uh, the var we need, prosthetic var we need. So usually it's uh, less than the standard sizing strategy. You're like, let's say the standard sizing. So, so we actually, uh, almost three years ago, we had a one paper published that, uh, in the CCI is uh, with, uh, we present our strategy is uh, actually we summarize some of the, uh, we use the first, uh, we use the superannual structures strategy uh, to do uh, the procedure for patients with a severe uh, back cosmic RVR. We have a great achievement um, for those patients. But now we do more and more patients, we use the Hanzo solution for more and more patients. So we're still getting back to think about something, to thinking about something. So I summarize here. So on my left this is the pros, on my right is the cons. So a uh, process looks like, looks like that. When we use the Hanzo solution, looks like we, for most cases, we can prevent the processes, the device diving uh, during the deployment. Uh, looks like it has a better expanding of stent frame because of the, the sizing is not so big, the size is not so big. So you, if the, you see that's too big size, the frame will be compressed by the native leaflets. So we uh, absolutely, uh, we have a significant lower incidence of permanent peacemaking implantation. Uh, a little, a little decreasing pavula leaky. Um, so maybe a less procedure complication like the annular rupture or the coronary obstruction because of the, uh, we downside. But there are some cons we think. Uh, usually for this kind of patients, because you cannot open the native leaflets. So usually for this kind of patients, we have great, they have a great transvarbular gradient, pressure good residual, uh, transvarbular pressure gradient. And now means, now means we select the, the size is too small. Your race is related to the, we cannot open the native leaflets. So for some patients, you know the balloon ceiling may be very good. However, when you put the device in, so the superannual ceiling may not so good. So your rate for those patients, we already do the downsides. So that we lost the opportunity of the, the annular ceiling. So if for this kind of patients, they have a good ceiling by balloon, but they have not good ceiling by the device. But we lost the chance of ceiling at the annular position. So until now, it's a very it's a big challenge is to organize a RCT study to com compare with the superannual sizing strategy with the regular standard uh, strategy. So I show you some of the initial data in our hospital. Looks like the 30 days mortality 
uh, we treat a bypass patient with the Hangzhou solution is only the one percent. So the permanent pacemaker implantation drop a lot. So only a one percent. And the PVR bigger than bigger or equal moderate or great is uh, still a nine percent. But all of those patients we achieved from the the first generation of device. So some. Uh, some operators, they are worried about a severe prosthetic patient mismatch. So, so it looks like uh, not so bad. It's a, in our center, it's around uh, 8%. Uh, now, the, it's the last slide I'm going to summarize here, uh, a take-home message. So more clinical evidence we need to for terror in back hospital ARD virus stenosis, especially for those with a severe calcify and uh, type 0 patients. So Hangzhou field solution may be feasible for some patients with a bypass, but may not for other patients in bypass. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Uh, Jian and Mayang. That was a fantastic uh, presentation and a totally new take on uh, how to uh, treat uh, bicuspid uh, aortic valve with the TAVAR procedure. Uh, I'll open it up for a, a discussion. Uh, uh, Pinak Shah from Mass General is going to talk about the U.S. perspective. And I wonder, you know, if uh, uh, Lars or Pinak have any thoughts on, uh, uh, you know, the Hangzhou method of uh, treating bicuspid uh, aortic valve. Yeah, I got two, two questions or two comments. Um, we have seen that Bicuspid aortic valve is more common in China than in the Western world. So my first question to you is, do you think it's because the population who's undergoing TAVA in China are younger than the patient who's undergoing TAVA in the Western world? And my second question is, when you use this balloon sizing technique, are you, which X-ray projection are you using? Because you know you can have the short axis or the long axis of the Commissure, so that must impact the size uh, of the balloon waste you measure. I uh, thank you for your very good questions. Uh, actually, I, I don't think the why we meet so many the patients with the back heart, not just uh, not just because of the a little bit younger age uh, with the tower, even the same age. So we need to do an epidemiology study. Even the same age, I think uh, maybe. In our in Chinese population has a high prevalence with the backup than the Western populations. So it looks like that. Um, also, we are doing some kind of the genetic study now. It's ongoing now, but before the uh, the result is coming, so we're still waiting for the answers. Uh, the balloon sizing during the balloon sizing, usually we we use the left anterior uh, projection. Uh, the left or anterior, uh, we usually use the left, left lateral or left uh, uh, LAO projection. So LAO projection is good for you to try to achieve the good sign of the waist of the waist. So usually we before we just we noted the the uh, the intensify during the angiogram, we just, uh, when the brain inflation, we loaded the intensifier, uh, the intensifier for 90 degrees. But later on, we change our policy. We just, uh, usually we fix it on the, in the LAO projection. Okay? Yeah, okay. and then we usually, Professor Wang, I'm Dr. Liu. Hi, how are you, Hi, Dr. Liu? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm the uh, assistant of Professor Wang. Yeah, you, yeah, from the projection, we usually, yeah, according to the CT scan and the alignment from the, the shoulder axis. And then we can see very clearly which the waist is the most uh, severe at that site. Yeah, uh, this is for the type zero. It's much easier to find this projection. And from the type one, uh, yeah, it, it, we also can use. So we can see from the CT scan, we can find a projection to see where is the the, the waste will be very severe. So, you know, because there are three cusps of the type, type one, and we can find a good position of projection to find a good view to see the, the waste. Okay, is that right, Professor Wang? 
Yes, yes, you're right, you're right. Mr. Matt Cavender, how often do you have um, discrepancies between your CT sizing and the size that you end up, size of valve that you end up putting in based on the waist of the balloon? Uh, valve in valve is, uh, uh, Dr. Liu, valve in valve is uh, possibly. So you, you, for the, for the bicuspid, the, the procedure in our center, I think maybe uh, three to four. Do you mean the valve in valve? No, I mean um, when you when you look at the CT scan and come up with a, a potential valve size based on your CT scan, how often does that valve size change when you do the balloon valvioplasty and then measure the waist? Are the, are they uh, are relatively the, concordant, or does the the size of a valve that you choose often change? Uh, ninety percent. Almost ninety percent for bicuspid with a severe calcification. Almost ninety percent we we do the downside. I see. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know, just uh, because Professor Wang and our team, we just used the yeah combined the use based on the CT scan, and we usually use the balloon size strategy. So we will combine the 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 waist of the balloon, and also we can consider the the size of the balloon and the annulus and then we will decide uh, a, a proper size of the the valve yeah so uh, so yeah you know said how他就是問那個他是不是問那個就就是說你們用博羅塞斯和用CT大概大概多就是多少比例是差不多是一致的多少是不一致的他問我們的問題是我們我們用了CT塞進以後 我们用了不能塞进，我们为什么被多少比例的病人我们改变了大小？哎，这个是这个问题啊。对，我现在在解，我在解释我们是怎么做的啊。Yeah, uh, yeah, so we we will use the combined the the sizing strategy with both uh, based on the CT scan and the balloon sizing. So about I think about seventy to eighty percent of our patients we will down one size one size, and uh, about two, twenty to thirty percent. According to the annulus, yeah. So maybe the because of the bicuspid, the the anatomy is different. Yeah. So not every patient that you downsize in our center. Great. Uh, especially for those patients with a severe calcified and a type zero bicuspid, so almost more than ninety percent. But for the not so severe, the error rate maybe so so not so high. Okay, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's great. So thank you, uh, Dr. Wang, and uh, that was an outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, so we'll continue to uh, move forward now. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Cavender, uh, who is uh, uh, Assistant Professor of Medicine at the University of North Carolina. He's also a co-director of cardiovascular research. He has a particular interest in uh, access uh, for uh, Tavar Wow, and he's going to discuss today axillary versus carotid versus cable uh, access. How do I choose? Welcome, Matt. Thank you very much. Let me share my screen here. Okay, so I appreciate the opportunity, Dr. Dave, to, to talk a little bit about how we approach access uh, in the current era and a little bit about the, um, uh, the things that we consider, some of the variables and our preferred uh, strategies here at the University of North Carolina. So here are our disclosures. So I want to actually go back to the uh, original partner trial uh, as, we, as we think through access. And as you will all remember the access, the access for uh, the partner trial was actually stratified based on whether patients were candidates for transfemoral access or candidates for transapical access only. In those patients uh, who were transfemoral access, had transfemoral access, they were then randomized to transfemoral tablet or AVR. 
And in those patients who did not have transdermal access, they were randomized to either a transapical TAVR or, uh, or surgical aortic valve displacement. And when you look at overall outcomes uh, in the patients who were treated with a transfemoral TAVR, you can see that they were better when compared to surgical aortic valve replacement. This is from Matt Reynolds' um, quality of life uh, uh, paper, which was published now in, um, uh, eight years ago in the Journal of American College of Cardiology. And what you can see here is in the purple circle, um, they are, uh, demonstrate that the quality of life is better for those patients who undergo transfemoral TAVR when compared uh, uh, to surgical aortic valve replacement. In the cohort of patients who did not have transfemoral access, which are denoted there in the yellow squares, you can see that transapical uh, TAVR was actually associated with worse healthcare quality of life, both at one year and at six months when compared to TAVR, suggesting that at least uh, from a healthcare quality of life perspective, surgical aortic valve replacement in the non transfemoral population uh, was actually uh, associated with better healthcare quality of life. And then if you look at the data slightly differently, on the left-hand slide, side of the slide, you can see with the transfemoral cohort, around 20% of those patients uh, treated with TAVR uh, were dead or uh, felt worse at one month, compared with almost 40% of those patients who received a surgical aortic valve who felt uh, worse or dead at one month. In the transapical cohort, uh, however, the outcomes were about the same with similar outcomes both with the transapical TAVR and with the surgical uh, aortic valve replacement, suggesting that in general, those patients with transfemoral access have better health quality of life and have better uh, outcomes. Over time, we've been able to treat more and more of our patients with transfemoral access. There have been significant improvements in the engineering of these valves, which has resulted in uh, reductions in the, in the sheath size required to deliver these valves uh, to the aortic position. You can see this slide from Edwards, which basically shows that the original sapien valve uh, required a 22 French uh, sheath, which was prohibitive for many uh, of our patients. And then over time, the sheath size has reduced to the current generation, which is approximately uh, 14 French. Medtronic has had similar reductions uh, in valve size. You can see the original uh, Medtronic uh, valves, which were studied and never really made it to market, required 25 French uh, uh, access. And the current generations of uh, Medtronic valves are now using their inline sheath down to 14 French. And so here are the current uh, recommendations in terms of the minimal luminal area required to, to proceed with transfemoral access. And you can see that that overall they're relatively similar, similar between both the sapien valves and the Medtronic valves, with those patients having uh, a diameter of between five and six, uh, at least being good candidates for uh, transfemoral access. However, you may need more min, uh, mean luminal area when there are things such as serial stenosis, tortuosity, and significant calcium. At the same time, the opposite is also true. Sometimes in those patients who do not have serial stenosis, tortuosity, or significant calcification, there may be the ability to push the boundaries on transfemoral access, particularly uh, if you have the ability for endovascular bailout if there are things such as dissections or uh, iliac perforation. In addition, it's important to realize that at times, CT scans can actually overestimate the uh, amount of uh, luminal area in which you, uh, you have to work with. Uh, this is uh, a technique which we have used uh, relatively frequently when we have CT scans, which suggest that there may not be uh, adequate transfemoral access to proceed with TAVR. You can see this case that we did just last week uh, over on uh, the left uh, iliac had basically no uh, ability to deliver a transcatheter aortic valve. However, the right axis overall looked relatively good, except for one area in the common iliac uh, at the bend into the aorta. You can see that when you use intravascular or ultrasound, you can get a better and more precise uh, measurement of the mean luminal area and the mean luminal diameter. And in this case, in particular, you can see that the IVUS probe uh, is right in that uh, specific area that was highlighted on the CT scan. And the corresponding image shows that in, in actuality, there was plenty of diameter and plenty of area to move forward with a transfemoral access, and that is actually the route in which we delivered this valve. 
such that uh, it's important to realize that CT scans at times can underestimate um, uh, the actual area and the diameter of the valve. So due to advances uh, both in imaging as well as uh, valve size, you can see that in the current era, the vast majority of cases uh, are done transdermally, with only 5% of cases uh, here in the United States as of October 17, 2017, being done uh, from a non-transdermal access. And so in general, it's important to realize that transdermal is and should be the preferred approach for the vast majority of cases. So what are the options for those patients who do not have uh, adequate iliac access to move forward with uh, uh, TAVR via the typical percutaneous uh, femoral access? So on this table, I've divided them into two areas. You can see that on the left, you can see the percutaneous options are femoral access, axillary, and then transcaval. And then the more surgical uh, options include uh, open transfemoral cut down, uh, open subclavian access, direct carotid, uh, direct aortic, and then suprasternal. And then I've crossed out apical because I believe in the current era there is little to no uh, area in which uh, apical transfemoral or uh, apical uh, transcatheter aortic valve replacement uh, should be uh, required. In the current era, when you specifically look at those patients who were treated with alternative access, you can see that subclavian access tends to be the, the preferred agent. With uh, cases increasing over time, corresponding with that, you can see that transapical access continues uh, to decline and is now um, uh, used in one out of four of the alternative access cases, with transaortic being slightly less, uh, transcaval uh, and, and suprasternal being um, less than 10% and transcarotid in general being utilized relatively uh, infrequently. So let's go through now the three uh, options which I think are most feasible for uh, most centers. The first is percutaneous uh, transaxillary. I'm not going to talk uh, much in this talk about open surgical. Uh, overall, they're relatively uh, similar, although obviously the percutaneous transaxillary becomes uh, slightly less invasive, and we'll go through some of the pros and cons of this. When you're accessing the transaxillary artery, you're moving, you're accessing the artery relatively uh, lateral, and you're uh, accessing it out in the delta pectoral groove. It's very important to use multiple modalities to access the artery. At our center, we use uh, not only uh, ultrasound, which is shown here, uh, but we also use uh, uh, an angiographic roadmap so that we can uh, access the artery uh, appropriately. This video uh, highlights here on the left uh, how uh, uh, the angle uh, at which the axillary approach allows you to take is very similar to that of which is seen from a, a, a transfemoral axis. You can see that in this uh, screen on the left, in which it's um, uh, magnified out, you can see that uh, the sheath uh, inserts from the left axillary comes over through the greater curvature of the arch and uh, lays in just like a, a normal uh, transfemoral uh, approach. You can see that this results in a very stable valve delivery system shown uh, on, on the right of the slide. It is uh, equally uh, advantageous both for a balloon expandable sapien valve uh, as it is for a, a self-expanding core valve. You can see in this core valve case here, you can see that there is a relatively uh, little angle here and you can see that the valve uh, sits nicely after an axillary uh, deployment. And so it's important to realize that this is going to require some extra equipment. In this particular talk, I'm not going to go through the exact steps uh, required to do this. I know that James Harvey last year uh, gave a very good talk on a step-by-step -step approach in ter terms of how to do this. But you can see that this is our basic setup where in general we have uh, one access site from the femoral uh, artery, either the left or the right, in which we have a long femoral sheath. And through that femoral sheath, we have an 018 wire uh, into the axillary artery from the fem femoral uh, area to give us a protection and the ability uh, to uh, use a dry closure technique and also the ability to place a covered stent if required and if there's bleeding. Through that same seven French femoral sheath, we have a pigtail which goes up through that sheath and sits uh, in the ascending aorta. And then obviously you can see the wire here uh, from the axillary in which we uh, have a valve uh, delivery. One of the nice things about percutaneous transaxillary is that managing bleeding uh, is relatively um, uh, straightforward. 
in general, uh, bleeding is not a significant issue because you're able to use percloses and uh, the area is relatively compressible uh, as long as you get access relatively uh, lateral in the delta pectoral groove. This is a patient who unfortunately was given epinephrine uh, due to a um, um, mistaken uh, read of a blood pressure that then resulted in their blood pressure going to nearly 250 uh, right after we uh, percloed the artery and then the uh, resulting uh, extravasation of contrast denoting significant bleeding which then uh, accompanied uh, that you can see it uh, spreading out into the fascial plane. Managing uh, this bleeding is relatively straightforward if you have access particularly from the groin. You place a covered stent across this with a, uh, a balloon expandable Vibon, which comes in a variety of different sizes and can be expanded from a minimum of uh, six millimeters all the way up, uh, up to over uh, 12 millimeters if needed. And you can see us positioning the uh, Vibon here in this position, subsequently deploying it, and then resulting in uh, achievement of hemostasis. So one of the advantages of the percutaneous transaxillary is obviously the minimally invasive nature, the fact that you can continue with conscious sedation, and the fact that bleeding becomes uh, uh, manageable. When you look at outcomes, this is data from uh, the TBT registry when compared to those patients who underwent a transaortic or transapical TAVR. You can see that mortality was lower in those patients who underwent a transaxillary TAVR. And this is despite the fact that almost 80% of these patients underwent an open subclavian access. You can see that stroke was significantly higher in this propensity matched cohort, uh, despite the fact that mortality moved in the other direction. The rates of stroke were uh, 6.3 in the cohort who underwent a transaxillary TAVR compared to 3.1% in those who uh, underwent a, a surgical thoracic implantation of the transcatheter valve. And you can see the associations in relative sense here with a 60% uh, a higher rate risk of uh, uh, mortality in those patients who underwent a thoracic transcatheter valve replacement, and this was counterbalanced by a lower risk of stroke. The rest of the outcomes were relatively similar between the two, the two groups. Now, what about non-thoracic cavity surgical access? There are basically two uh, ways in which you can access the vasculature aside from the subclavian. The first is a transcarotid incision, which is probably uh, a more similar or more frequent. At our institution, we actually utilize a similar uh, approach. However, we go through the suprasternal approach, which is an incision which mirrors that of a media stenoscopy, and you can see the different areas in which uh, those incisions are made here. Just briefly for the suprasternal access, it uses this port, which allows access to the innominate or uh, even the aortic arch, depending specifically on the anatomy. Here's a video that I hope will project. See the device being set up here, just above the sternum. See surgical access using basic laparoscopic techniques, dissecting out to the artery, the innominate there. And then valve deployment goes relatively uh, 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 standard. And then after you take out the sheath, shown here, first string sutures are used to close the arteriotomy. Sutures are tied down through the port access. <clears throat> and this is the artery after direct closure. The alternative access uh, is one that's been uh, promoted um, by Dr. Allen, who's on the panel with us today, and he has had shown very good outcomes using a transcarotid approach. In general, this is relatively similar to a suprasternal approach, except that it uses uh, a little bit higher up in the vasculature. You can see to make a transverse incision across the carotid artery relatively near uh, the sternum and then directly access the vasculature this way. He recently published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery just uh, within the past year, the outcomes in a propensity matched cohort of the transcarotic carotid uh, group compared also to uh, transapical or transaortic implantation. You can see that overall device success was relatively uh, good. Uh, the procedure time took approximately two hours and was slightly shorter in the transcarotid group um, and the conversion to surgery was relatively low. When you look at all-cause mortality, you can see that those patients who underwent transcarotid TAVR had a lower uh, risk of mortality as compared to those in the transapical and transaortic. 
and you can see that their quality of life was significantly better than those patients who underwent a transapical or transaortic uh, uh, tablet. ICU uh, length of stay was relatively short, and a higher proportion of patients were discharged to home, which is, I think, a very important metric when we think about our high-risk population. So I'll finally uh, end with transcable. Uh, this is a uh, relatively infrequently used access technique, which is really, uh, I think, reserved for those people who really have no other uh, alternative uh, access. As you can see, there's a catheter, which is placed in the aorta at roughly the L5 or L4 uh, area. And in a corresponding uh, level, a catheter is placed in the IVC. You can see that uh, shown here on the left of the screen, the IVC and the aorta lay in relatively close proximity to each other, and they are within the retroperitoneal space. And it's important to realize that the retroperitoneal pressure is actually higher than the venous pressure. So uh, in general, the bleeding from the aorta goes, should go into the, uh, to the IVC, at least in theory. And a, uh, a stiff wire is used to make a connection between the IVC and the aorta. And this is then used to facilitate uh, a passage of the sheath into the vascular access. Uh, after this, uh, valve deployment is uh, relatively standard. And then at the end, uh, an amplaster device is used to seal the aorta uh, and reduce the uh, bleeding from the aorta over to the, to the venous outcomes. Here are the outcomes with uh, transcapal access. This was reported in Jack in 2017, and just within the last several months, they reported uh, out to their one-year outcomes. You can see that overall, they were able to deploy uh, the valve successfully in 98 out of 100. 30-day uh, survival uh, was 92%, and translating uh, to an 8% mortality associated uh, with this procedure. The Achilles heel of this procedure continues to be major vascular complications. You can see that uh, overall bleeding and vascular complications were very high. Uh, almost one out of five patients had a major, major vascular complication, and one out of three required a blood transfusion. In addition, there continues to be evidence of persistent uh, fistula between the aorta and the IVC uh, in a fourth of the patients uh, at 30 days. Although in their one-year data, they showed that this uh, fistula had closed in the vast majority uh, in almost all of them. So as we think about uh, what uh, access site for our, our, our alternative access site is most appropriate, I think it's important to, to make a couple observations. And this is data specifically from the United States from TBT uh, that was published uh, in 2019. And it's important to realize that the median number of cases performed at a hospital in the United States is around 50 uh, TAVRs per year, with one out of four hospitals per, um, uh, uh, doing TAVR in less than 36 cases per year. If you look at it on a per operator base, basis, almost a quarter of operators have less than 17 cases per year. And so for this reason, I think it's very important to think about what the relationship between volume and outcomes uh, are. And what you can see is that there is a very clear volume outcomes relationship. Uh, shown here on the left of the slide, you can see that mortality, shown here in the adjusted mortality, shown here on the blue, is significantly higher for those uh, hospitals which do uh, uh, less than 50 TAVRs per year. And then it tends to level out when hospitals do more than about 150 to 200. This slide is shown in a different way. This is the relative reduction in mortality between uh, volumes of 30 and 151. And in other words, that having a lower reduction is, is, is worse in this particular case. And what you can see is that there is a very um, a clear difference uh, based on annualized hospital uh, procedural volume. This uh, appears to be significantly uh, greater in those non-transfemoral TAVR cases, where you can see that for transfemoral TAVR, the volume and outcome relationship is relatively flat, although it does still uh, persist. However, in those patients undergoing a non-transfemoral TAVR, you can see that there is a very clear relationship between hospital out, uh, volume and, and outcomes. And in fact, even when you look at the uh, transaxillary cases that I showed you, um, the data from the TBT today, in which uh, the overwhelming majority, 81%, were surgical exposures, you can see that uh, the vast majority of centers had performed uh, less than five uh, transaxillary cases. So thinking a little bit about uh, choosing a, an alternative access site, here's the way I approach the risks and benefits of these different alternative access sites. In general, percutaneous transaxillary is our preferred access. 
Uh, the complexity of this is relatively low, especially if you have uh, uh, the ability uh, to do vascular procedures. You're able to use conscious sedation. The outcomes in general are favorable. The risk of bleeding is low. Its, uh, invasiveness is relatively low. The cost is a little bit higher than that of transfemoral due to some of the extra sheets and potential balloons, but length of stay is low with the majority of our patients going home the next day. In general, carotid, uh, or at our center, uh, suprasternal is the next uh, preferred uh, yeah. Uh, access site. Uh, in general, uh, implantation and complexity is relatively low. However, it does require general anesthesia. The outcomes, as we've shown, are favorable. It is slightly more invasive due to the need uh, for, uh, for a surgical incision. Uh, however, the cost is uh, relatively intermediate and is driven mostly by the need for uh, surgical uh, IC, uh, uh, surgical um, uh, OR space, and the length of stay at our center is, is around two days. In general, transcable is significantly more complex, requires general anesthesia, has very high rates of bleeding, and I think is the least preferred of these agents. And I believe in the current era, transapical TAVR uh, uh, should not currently uh, be used except in exceptional situations. So in summary, transfemoral is the preferred uh, mode of delivery when feasible. Current delivery systems makes transfemoral access feasible for the overwhelming majority of patients. There's really minimal, if any, role for transapical access. Uh, we at the University of North Carolina uh, utilize percutaneous transaxillary access as the preferred alternative access site and then use suprasternal access for patients without femoral or axillary access. And that um, there is a clear uh, volume and outcomes relationship. This is most apparent when looking at, at alternative access. Operators need to choose a mode of alternative access and become proficient in that mode, and low-volume centers need to refer their patients to centers which do high volumes of alternative access. Thanks. Thanks, Matt, uh, for that uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Um, uh, excellent uh, summaries of uh, all the different uh, potential access. I think there's a lot to discuss, but I know we are a little behind time. Uh, it's a uh, um, and we need to uh, keep moving forward. Uh, so uh, thanks so much again. And, and uh, now I'd uh, like to invite our uh, next speaker, uh, Dr. Uh, Zeng Bin, uh, who is going to fill in for uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Yong Jian Wu. Uh, I, I want to thank him anyway, though. He's a professor and chief physician at the Fu Wai Hospital, as well as vice director in cardiology and the principal investigator for the DVD study. Uh, Dr. Zhang Bin, however, will speak uh, in his place, uh, and uh, he is going to discuss a Chinese aval study, uh, a DVD study. Okay, great. I can hear him now. Yeah. Uh, Professor Deme? Yes. You, you need you need uh, invite this uh, UYJ to come in. UYJ. He, in. he no, is he's not no, he's not in UYJ. Okay. Oh, he's in. He's in, yeah. He's here. Okay. I see his name. Yeah. Uh, we are so sorry. I'm calling uh, Dr. Zhang to get online. Yes, Professor. Oh, he said his connection is being disconnected. He's trying to uh, get online. I see him in the uh, list, so he is promoted. Uh, okay, I see. Uh, YJ Wu. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
<clears throat> so, um, so uh, before uh, Dr. John get online, can I uh, ask a question for I Professor? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what's the percentage you know uh, you need to consider about the alternative access in your uh, center? Because in China, maybe we uh, have 18% of Terra patients, we need to consider the alternative access because uh, we only have 18 to 20 French uh, shades, you know, for Chinese wealth. Uh, and also, you know, uh, in China, we uh, always not consider about the trans accelerate uh, access because, you know, uh, Chinese patients, uh, uh, many patients, you know, the the diameter is less than five millimeter for, for the axillary artery. Uh, so we always choose transcrotid or transapical. Yeah, so in my center, uh, I would say that uh, we probably do alternative access less than 2% uh, of the time. Uh, in, on May 16th, we will have a part two of this uh, session where we're gonna be discussing different strategies of how to make a femoral access, you know, more suitable for Tavar procedure. Now I'm a vascular specialist. So for me, you know, it's very easy because I open up many occluded iliac arteries and things like that to, to do a Tavar. So it's rarely required. However, um, uh, many uh, interventional cardiologists who don't do vascular mm -hmm. procedures, you know, we're trying to get them more familiar with the iliac interventions such as, you know, rotational atherectomy in the iliac arteries, do lithoplasty to open up calcified iliac arteries to allow uh, uh, femoral access to do the tower. And then uh, uh, alternative access is required less and less. Um, let's ask Matt uh, if he's still uh, available to see how many percentage of time he has uh, uh, in his center that they are using alternative access. Yeah, our numbers uh, largely reflect those uh, that I showed from the TBT registry. Uh, we do about 5% uh, of our cases from um, uh, alternative access site. Of those, almost all of them are percutaneous transaxillary. We have very few that in the current era that we're needing to do suprasternal. In fact, I think I myself, I don't think I have done a suprasternal now in almost uh, two years, and I think my partner has only done one or two. We're pretty aggressive about um, doing transfemoral access. We often will push the limit um, on uh, mean luminal area, and we often will, if we need to, to balloon an iliac, if there's a spot that's, uh, that's difficult, we often will balloon that to facilitate passage of the sheath. I think the people who are, are harder are those people who are small in stature and have diffusely, um, uh, either diffusely diseased vessels or people who are just very small and have, have small vasculature. Those are the people who tend to be uh, a little bit more challenging and it's harder to push the limits on. Thank you. Okay, I think that uh, what we are going to do, the, um, uh, the connection from uh, Dr. Wu Yongjian is very unstable. Uh, and we're gonna uh, skip his talk uh, now. We will have his talk again on the 16th of May. And uh, let's move on to the debate now. We have a, uh, a very exciting debate. And we can, of course, uh, come back to him if his uh, connection improves. Uh, so uh, debate one is a choice of uh, Tavar Wild. Uh, Self-expanding is all uh, you can see. Can you see the owner's face? And uh, that will be uh, 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 who is a professor of medicine and cardiology at the University of uh, Cleveland at Harrington Heart and Vascular Institute. He's been a long-term uh, 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 faculty at uh, C3 meeting, great supporter of C3 meeting and a fantastic uh, structural uh, heart operator. So he's yeah. going to discuss today. Uh, all uh, you need. Welcome, Dr. Atizani. Thank, thank you, Raj. C can you see my screen? I absolutely can. Looks great. Okay, great. Excellent. Okay, so let's discuss a little bit about the choice of the Tavar valve, and I'm going to try to convince you that uh, the self-expandable is all you need. Obviously, my talk is going to be largely based on the data that we have from uh, core valve uh, family uh, valves because that's uh, these are the ones approved in the United States and these are the ones that we have more uh, data on.
So we're going to discuss here several different uh, aspects of uh, the reasons why I think that uh, self-expandable valve is all you need. We're going to start, obviously, with the vascular access, as uh, Matt was mentioning in his talk, right? So the, the profile of the self-expandable valve is uh, smaller than the current profile of the balloon expandable valve. So we can treat uh, vasculatures that are above uh, five millimeter. And that would, in comparison with Sapien, which we would need uh, 5.5 and 6 millimeter, that would enable us to potentially treat more patients. So if I have only a solo valve on my shelf, I would be able to treat uh, a uh, larger number of patients, seven, uh, approximately 17% more patients could be treated with uh, these devices. And that's largely based uh, on the fact that we can uh, utilize the inline sheet so we don't have to keep a sheet inside to, uh, uh, to be able to perform this procedure. Therefore, we can uh, approach a smaller uh, vasculatures. This is also the self-expendable valves are extremely safe devices. And again, I go back to the, uh, I go back to the uh, access uh, that the, we have a, a much smaller OD and therefore having a smaller OD we know that this is associated with less vascular complications compared with the balloon expandable valve. Another important aspect of the safety of the self-expandable valves is the fact that you can see on the slide that the, you never rupture the annulus with the self-expandable valve. You might rupture if you are aggressively, aggressively uh, perform pre-dilatation or post-dilatation, but the valve itself is extremely safe. And here, uh, uh, when we're dealing with the centers, smaller centers that are gonna be performing tower more and more, I think having the self-expandable valve safety is something that is really desirable. Folks that are not gonna do uh, many procedures per year as Matt uh, just showed. So I think the, the safety of the self-expandable devices is, is uh, a great uh, feature. And also the fact that we can recapture the self-expandable valve. So the fact that we can recapture and reposition the valve, this is data that we just uh, proved on Jack intervention, uh, showing that the, this, this is a very safe uh, feature of these devices that we can uh, actually perform the recapturing and reposition if we're not happy with the position or if we have conduction disturbances. So this is a great feature of the device, which is not enabled by uh, the balloon expandable valve that you have just one opportunity to perform uh, the implantation. Regarding PVL, which was initially, we remember very well in the initial generation of the self-expandable devices that uh, PVL was, uh, was a, a bigger concern, right? But over time, with the, when we got better devices over time, moving from core valve to Evolut R and then Evolut Pro, of course, this combined with the experience of the operators and the knowledge of the procedure in terms of implantation depth, for example, we were able to progressively reduce uh, PVL rates. So this is, I don't think this is a concern anymore for, for, uh, for uh, the Evolut uh, family of valves, Evolut Pro Plus in this case. Uh, very rarely we see paravalvular leak that is more than mild and honestly, normally what we see is either no paravalvular leak or uh, trivial PVL. So PVL, I don't think is a concern either. Permanent pacemaker implantation, obviously, as we all know, uh, permanent pacemaker in the initial generation of core valve, again, um, deeper implants, the knowledge of, and the, the, the impossibility of recapture in the initial uh, generation of core valve, uh, made it the uh, pacemaker rates to be extremely high and in some series, European series, actually uh, as high as uh, 25 to 30 percent of pacemaker. This progressively came down. The ability to recapture the valve uh, uh, significantly uh, improved that, but still in the low risk trial, uh, permanent pacemaker rates were high with a self-expandable valve, right? Uh, we have to remember that the, the formal recommendation of the implantation of the devices, which is in between three and five millimeters depth, uh, this recommendation I think uh, is probably going to um, go away and we're gonna see more and more the fact that we can, uh, we should go shallower. In fact, this is, a, this is our data here of, of pacemaker implantations with self-expandable valve, which we just submitted to Jack Intervention. Uh, but basically, 
by doing a very simple thing, which is implanting this valve, the target implantation from zero to one, rather than utilizing the target from three to five, we're able, and we can accomplish that in more than 90% of patients without any CT fancy assessments such as the MIDA study. This is a simple switching the target from, from three to five to zero to one. We were able to reduce pacemaker implantation rates to 3.1% in self-expandable valves. So I think this is a very, very good number, solid number, which is pretty much similar to, to surgical valves. Probably surgical valves is a little less than that, but very much similar to that. So I am comfortable with that. And I, I can, if we can achieve that with self-expandable valves, that is also uh, uh, great. Then hemodynamics, this is a conversation that uh, as, as uh, Lars mentioned in his talk also about hemodynamics, the, the supranularity of these devices. Um, everybody knows this data from Becky Ham, but basically um, the message here is that the, in fact, self-expandable valves uh, demonstrated that the hemodynamics of these devices, mostly when we're, when, when we're dealing with smaller annuli, they de deliver uh, better hemodynamics compared with, uh, with balloon expandable valves. And this is data from the low risk trials showing that uh, actually the uh, hemodynamics of the supraannular valve actually outperforms the, the surgical valve. And importantly, we have uh, much less uh, patient prosthesis mismatch with, with the self expandable valve compared with surgical valves. And uh, which is uh, not true for uh, the Sapien device, which was a balloon expandable valve, that you can see that the hemodynamics of this transcatheter valve here was uh, similar to the hemodynamics of the surgical valves. In addition, right, another important, uh, if, if I'm, I'm going to have only one valve, that's all we need, as the title of the talk is, well, I am able to also treat larger annuli with uh, the self-expandable valve. So the 34 valve enables me to perform greater oversizing than the biggest valve uh, from the balloon expandable. Obviously, um, uh, there is a lot of conversation in terms of adding one, two, three, four, five cc's to the balloon of the balloon expandable valve. We don't really know what the impact of this uh, is going to be lo very long term. There is some data like at out, out of one year, but we don't know what very long-term impact. These valves were not meant to be over-inflated the balloon. I don't know if that's gonna have a, an impact on leaflet, on durability, on central AI. We don't really know that. So I think, uh, again, the ability of the, uh, the self-expandable, largest valve self-expandable to perform large oversize enables me to safely treat patients with larger uh, annuli. And here you can see that we have side by side, right? The balloon expandable and the self expandable valves. So, this is basically to try to understand whether or not patients would have patient prosthesis mismatch. And you can see that here in green for the 34 valve, even patients with uh, large uh, uh, body surface areas, you have no patient prosthesis mismatch. So, enabling me to treat uh, patients uh, with uh, larger NLI. Uh, and also, obviously, when you compare side by side, the similar sizes of Evolute and, uh, and, and Sapien, you see that the, uh, the, balloon, the self expandable valve leads to less uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. Why this is important? We all know that patient prosthesis mismatch not only increase uh, potential, uh, uh, potential increase in mortality, but also structural valve deterioration. This was just discussed by Lars in his talk. So, uh, likely that's going to impact down the road uh, the, uh, the, uh, the generation of the, uh, of the uh, transcatheter valves. Importantly also, uh, when we talk about hemodynamics, is the fact that when you pay attention to what happens when we treat valve in valve patients, right? So here, when, when we have patients with smaller uh, surgical valves, look at what happens when we implant sapin and uh, core valve the incidence of gradients that are higher than 20 millimeters of mercury is way higher with sapin. Obviously, this comes down once we treat larger surgical valves. Uh, obviously, I understand that uh, there is uh, the whole conversation of fracturing surgical valves with sapin, but yeah, if there is one valve to be used involving valve, should be a self-expandable supraannular valve that's going to deliver better hemodynamics. And why this is important? Well because when we have gradients that are greater than 20 millimeters of mercury involved, involved we know it impacts uh, mortality long-term. So definitely 
this is something that we would like to achieve gradients that are uh, uh, you know, ideally in the single digits. And if there is a valve to do it, it's a self-expandable supranular valve, but importantly, well implanted, right? If you implant a self-expandable valve deep, right, then you're gonna lose the supranularity. So a perfect implantation of a self-expandable supranular valve is going to definitely deliver you better hemodynamics. Well, here, it's interesting. This is data that we, uh, we're uh, submitting to Jack now. This is data from the TVT registry uh, showing that the mean gradient of, this is 5,800 patients from the TVT registry. This is the mean gradient that we observed in valve in valve with the supranular valve. Uh, um, of course, I just put this side by side here. This is not meant to be a, a direct comparison. So let's interpret this data a little bit uh, carefully. But uh, this is the data from the partner to valve in valve registry, which had a larger, a higher gradient compared with, uh, with the ones that we uh, observed here in our series. And even if when you look at the native balloon expandable valve partner three trial, look at the mean gradient, which was 13.7, uh, not largely different from the gradient we observed with valve in valve for the uh, balloon, uh, for the self expandable uh, supranular valves. This is just a quick example here of a, a patient. I'm not gonna show the whole CT assessment, but this patient with an error of 322, this perimeter of 66, wide sinuses, this calcium that protrudes down to the LVOT. If I had treated this patient with a 20 millimeter, uh, with a sapien valve, it would have been a 20 millimeter sapien uh, versus a 26 millimeter uh, self-expandable valve, which delivers me a much larger EOA. And if I had done a 20 millimeter sapien, I would have left, the patient would left, have left the table with patient prosthesis mismatch, whereas with the Evolute valve, patient left with no patient prosthesis mismatch. And I always say that not only the hemodynamics of the, of the self-expandable valve is better because it's supraannular, but also because you can oversize the device more liberally due, it, due to its safety. Therefore, you can uh, get uh, way uh, better uh, hemodynamics overall. Durability, this is something that uh, Lars uh, stressed in his talk. Of course, uh, we still need some uh, data. That Lars showed the, the, the data from, the, from his uh, study from the Notion, but also we have data from the Corvalve Advanced Study out of five years, recently published by Luca Testa, the data from the uh, Italian Corvalve Register showing good uh, results over time with the self-expandable valve with low incidence of structural valve deterioration over time. Um, also, the choice trial, although this is uh, uh, grossly underpowered, but I think the, the message here, uh, uh, we can be really hard to make a, a comment with one versus the other, but overall, the, the uh, durability uh, of the, of the self-expandable platform was uh, good, very good out of uh, five years. Very quickly, now almost done here with my talk. So we have also data from Bicuspid. Basil just presented this uh, on ACC, but basically I think this was, uh, although not a randomized study, I think we need much more data, it was just a registry, but at least it showed that with the, with the uh, uh, utilization of the self-expandable supranular valve, we, uh, we were able to obtain very good results with, uh, with uh, uh, basically no, no, no PVL, which was more than mild with a significant improvement in the NYJ functional class. Uh, and also, uh, I think the paravalvular leak, which was uh, really uh, some, some uh, concern with this, I think it was, uh, didn't, didn't show to be a concern. I think it was very similar to what we obtained in tricuspid valve. So this is very, uh, very promising data. And also the hemodynamics of this device, remember that we are able to decouple the actual valve function from the annulus. Uh, so although the, the valve might be not completely circular, no, not completely uh, well uh, circular, but also the, the functioning valve is going to actually be uh, circular and it's going to uh, work supraannularly. So the hemodynamics was great, as great as the ones we observed with uh, tricuspid valves. And then finally, just my last slide, there's a lot to talk about long-term plan. I just picked one specific here uh, that Gilbert just published on, on uh, Jack Intervention that uh, the concern of coronary access, right? So at, with, with the self-expandable valves, we can uh, at least perform, it's not ideal, right? The way we do it today, I think there will be, if we had a mechanism in the catheter, I know that uh, industry is working to achieve that, that we could actually do the commissure alignment once we are almost across the valve, that would be better, but at least there is a way for us to, to perform 
commissure alignment, there is a much higher likelihood of obtaining uh, commissure alignment with the self-expandable valve, which is not true. We cannot. That's basically tossing a coin with SAPIN, and, uh, and that might be a problem long term. Toby, who is also on, on the line here, just published a paper that we might have difficulties uh, long term uh, getting uh, coronary access even with SAPIN uh, valve. So just to conclude, I think uh, all you need is love uh, and all you need is self-expandable valves. Thanks for your attention. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Guillermo. That was a very strong uh, endorsement of the self-expanding valve. Uh, now to endorse the balloon expandable mm -hmm. valve, uh, we'll have Pradeep Yadav, uh, who uh, is uh, assistant uh, professor of medicine, uh, as well as a professor of cardiology at uh, Piedmont uh, Heart Institute in uh, Atlanta. Uh, he's a, a very well-known uh, structural interventionist who's co-director of the C3's uh, structural program. Uh, and I'd like to welcome uh, Pradeep to now uh, talk about uh, balloon expandable is all what you need. Hello, everyone. I'm just trying to get my slides up. Are you able to see it now? Yep. See, it's great. Excellent. Excellent talk on core valve. Evolute, Dr. Tizan is a master operator. Here are, here are my disclosures. So many devices, which one to choose? And in the United States, you know, we are limited by the FDA approval for commercial use to mainly three valves. And on the extreme right is, you see a Lotus valve by Boston Scientific, which is approved only for high prohibitive risk. So for low risk intermediate, we have only Edward Sapien as well as the Medtronic Evolute valve. So the bulk of the data comes from these two valves and the other ones are experimental for now. Excuse me, let me just remove this. So when I look at what valve do you need in a practice and you have to pick one, you have to think about what's a workhorse situation, a valve that works for every day-to-day case has results best in class and then when you need in special situations high stress situations it can overcome those challenges and when you put those things in our perspective for workhorse quality you want a low pacemaker rate very low paravalvular regurgitation good hemodynamics and preserve coronary access not just after the first ever but even after future tower in tavers special situations come into play like bicuspid anatomy, extremes of sizes, very large annulus. Do we have any data on very large annuli, very small annuli? What about valve and valves? And on top of that, if a valve can be versatile where it can be used from every single access, utilized for TAVR anywhere in the world, and then you could also top it with other locations, not just aortic, just learning one platform, you can use other locations as well gives additional features. So is there any concrete data comparing the two different transcatheter valves that are most commonly used, meaning Edward Sapien and the Medtronic Evolute valve? And the, and the real data comparing head to head is very low or minimal. This is a choice trial which just published their five-year outcomes showing absolutely no difference in mortality, but you see and the numbers are very, very small. So it's very hard to conclude something major from this study just because the sample size was small, otherwise a well done study. This January 2020, we had two papers published in circulation from France. These are not randomized trials, but these are retrospective studies, propensity match comparison from French uh, TAVI registry and a nationwide analysis, both showing balloon expandables have lower all cause as well as cardiovascular mortality. So because there is no real head-to-head -head multiple randomized uh, control trials, you have to look at individual trials and try to tease out features from these trials. The two low-risk studies were presented at American College of Cardiology meeting last year, and where we saw Medtronic Evolute met its primary endpoint and was not inferior to surgical aortic valve replacement. On the same day, the, present, the second presentation, Partner 3 trial, which not only was non-inferior, but was actually superior to surgery. Now, the point here is the primary endpoint did include rehospitalization, and that may have driven wider difference. <clears throat> Permanent pacemaker is 
almost 6% in this low risk study on Sapien, which continues to be slightly high, higher than what you would like for your typical uh, low risk patient. And this was inconsistent. This, these rates were inconsistent with the previous ones, although the Sapien rates were 6.5, significantly lower than the previous trials. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Evolute trial pacemaker rates were also relatively lower than the first and second generation valves, but still higher than where you would like. This is data from the TVT registry, just comparing three generations of self-expanding valve. And what you see here is that Evolute Pro still has about 14% pacemaker rate in the real world TVT registry in the United States. And who gets a pacemaker? P balloon expandable valve has consistently shown to be at lowest risk of permanent pacemaker. The pacemaker we know is bad. It, whether it's lack of improvement in LVEF, whether it's increased rehospitalization, or even if it's mortality, pacemaker has adverse consequences. And it's not just permanent pacemaker. Outcomes, outcomes in left bundle branch block after towers are equally worse. All cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, rehospitalization, and a 30-day pacemaker implantation, all are worse in patients who are discharged from the hospital after TAVR with a new left bundle branch block. And what are the predictors of left bundle branch block post TAVR? Well, like Dr. Atizani mentioned, depth of implant is a big factor, but also implantation of a sapien valve has lower chances of getting new left bundle these, on the blue, you see the Edward Sapien valve, whereas the red, you see the core valves and the incidences of left bundle branch block. Paravalvular regurgitation still remains an Achilles heel of TAVR. It has come down, but is still not completely gone. And from the early trials, only moderate or severe impacted long-term outcomes, but maybe in these, as we move to younger risk group, younger patients, low risk population, maybe these mild or trace PVL is going to come into play and time will tell us. This is, these are the graphs from the low risk trials, uh, randomized trials uh, presented at HCC. And you can see in partner study, moderate or more PVL was very rare, whereas it was still 4.3% moderate in the Corval low risk study. So what about small annuli? Patient prosthesis mismatch seemed to be a big scare. And let's just look, it is true that PPM is present and it has been shown many, many times, but one thing is true that it is less in TAVR trials as compared to the surgical trials. And it does impact surgical outcomes. So moderate or severe PPM has higher mortality but that data is coming from a surgical literature. With balloon expandable valves, the PPM is less as compared to surgery, and it's even lower as you move to continued access registry. However, there is really no signal for mortality in transcatheter aortic valves studies. So why is there discrepancy between these studies? Why is there no mortality signal with PPM in patients undergoing TAVR? Are we calculating effective orifice area indexed correctly? Because by CT, we're getting much less frequent PPM. And are we underestimating the EOA on echocardiogram and therefore overestimating the PPM and the gradients? Because remember, the simplified Bernoulli's formula was accurate for na native aortic stenosis, not necessarily for normal bioprosthesis. And then there is a pressure recovery phenomenon. So echo measures vena contracta at the narrowest point, which is the worst point. After that, the pressure recovers. So the net gradient, in, net gradient is actually lower than the worst part at the vena contracta. So then, and this net pressure gradient is the one that determines burden on the left ventricle. And therefore by echo, you may have a different gradient. However, by cath, the net gradient is relatively similar. These are early findings and may need to be, and definitely needs to be further confirmed. And I think this, may, this phenomenon of pressure recovery may be further amplified when you have different prostheses in place. 
What about very large annuli beyond the recommendation limits? As you know, 683 is the cutoff on the IFU for the Edwards Sapien 29 millimeter Sapien 3 valve. This is the data on 97 patients from 30, 13 center, one year outcomes, and the mean area was 722 millimeter square with a range of up to 852 as the upper limit. And the mean perimeter was 96.8. So relatively large annulus. And you can see really 1% 30-day mortality and one year was around 10%. Stroke was 2%. And paravalvular regurgitation was 4.1% was, uh, uh, at one year. And you can see there was a very little transvalvular aortic regurgitation and the gradients hemodynamics were all in the acceptable range. We've heard Chinese experience on bicuspid. We're gonna hear more about uh, it later the, on the US perspective. But what about, I just wanna mention the sapient data in bicuspid. 2,691 propensity matched patients have been studied. Now this is again, not a randomized trial. It's a data from the US uh, TVT registry that's showing slightly higher risk of stroke compared to the tricuspid aortic valves. Uh, but still not horrible. And the pacemaker rate is still within acceptable range for bicuspids and no difference in one year mortality when you look at Sapien 3 in bicuspid versus tricuspid tavers. There's no difference in paravalvular leak or aortic valve gradients or the aortic valve areas between bicuspid or tricuspid when used uh, Edward Sapien valves. But as we've heard previously in the talk, and we'll probably hear it again later today, not all bicuspids are same. Watch for severe calcification. And sometimes there is no easy solution for bicuspids. Use a self-expanding device, you, you're gonna end up with a PVL. And on this, on, along the same lines, if you be aggressive with the balloon expandable valve, could end up with a rupture. So sometimes there is no easy solution and uh, uh, maybe surgery should be considered in select patients. Now, some myth busters. What about low EF patients? Pacing is dangerous. Avoid balloon expandable. Patient will crash if you pace. What about coronary artery disease? This is a patient, as you can see, very diffuse, severe, multivessel coronary artery disease. Pacing kills. How is this patient going to tolerate rapid pacing at 180 beats a minute? And to complicate that further, no femoral access, so do you need an alternate access for this? So here is a balloon expandable valve done under general anesthesia, TEE, the same patient left axillary cut down with excellent result, and this patient continues to do well over a year and a half now. Valve in valve, here's an example of 23 millimeter mosaic valve with a true ID of 19, and yes, if you had implanted a 20 millimeter valve inside it, you, could, you would have ended up with a patient prosthesis mismatch. However, we have learned from Dr. Allen's group um, how to modify these surgical valves. And here's a true balloon with a biprosthetic valve fracture and then followed by a Sapien 3 implantation, achieving an excellent result with very good hemodynamics and no PPM. You could choose to fracture the valve before or after as per the operator's choice. There is little more nuances in that. We will not go into those because of time constraints. What about future? Think future, think innovation. Not just today's tavern, but think about what's gonna happen once, you do, once you're done with the valve. How are people going to get into those coronaries after this tavern? And coronary artery disease is fairly common in the tavern population and it coronary access will be tough and it's not that uncommon. You'll have several factors that you'll have to consider, obviously, that goes into this and those are along the lines of root anatomy, the sinuses anatomy, how high are the coronaries, but also the procedural aspects, you know, how high the valve was implanted and was the commissural post aligned or not. And remember, if the post is not aligned, the covered part of, of the evolute will not allow coronary engagement. And even with the commissural alignment that Dr. Gilbert Tang's group has shown us, it's not perfect. It's not all the time well aligned. And 
we cannot see these on fluoroscopy. So an expert tabber operator can obviously look at these tabs and make a guess where this is. But think about an average interventionalist who's not doing tabber, excellent interventionalist, but is not familiar with the valve structure itself, may run into a problem trying to navigate these posts. And I, as I said, commercial posts are not aligned. They're rarely, if anything, like 22% were aligned in this study. Implications of intraannular and supraannular after the second valve. Once you put a taver in taver, the supraannular leaflets of the first valve are going to be sandwiched and essentially cover the access to the coronaries. And so it's important to realize how high these leaflets are going to deflect. And some valves are going to deflect their leaflets very high if they're supraannular. Whereas the balloon expandable valve is a shorter valve and will not go very high in the aortic root. So pick the first transcatheter valve carefully. And this is one of the examples where short height may benefit. So this is coming back to the versatility point that the balloon expandable does allow you to go through any access available, including transapical, which is rare, but is not obsolete. And every once in a while, you would need it. And with all those features, if you can get a very good drivability, if you can go through any tortuosity with excellent result, that's icing on the cake. In this study, what they're showing is that when you have aortic angulation after a certain degree, that aortic angulation does not impact results of balloon expandable valve in any complications or adverse outcomes. Whereas in a self-expanding valve, aortic angulation decreases device success, more post dilations, more paravalvular regurgitation, and higher PVR recommendation, higher uh, paravalvular regurgitation. So this is my conclusion slide. So for all the reasons I listed above, I think a balloon expandable valve is all you need for your routine workhorse day to day, as well as special situations. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Pradeep, uh, for uh, that fantastic uh, presentation. Both uh, Dr. Tizani and uh, Dr. Yara both have given a very strong uh, uh, endorsement to uh, their uh, choice of valves. Uh, originally, I was planning to have uh, some debate discussion, but I think that we're behind. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm going to pick on um, uh, what Pradeep uh, just recently was talking about related to the coronary access. Uh, in fact, at this year's C3, we were planning on having an entire session on a coronary uh, occlusion during tower as well as reaccess uh, to now to talk about uh, predicting and preventing uh, coronary occlusion during tower as well as reaccess uh, coronary post tower. Uh, it's a, a great privilege to have uh, uh, Jim uh, Harvey, a close friend uh, from a very nearby uh, place from where I live. Uh, he's a, uh, also a professor of cardiology and a structural heart interventionalist at York Hospital at, at Wellspan uh, in York, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, we recently did a, a training program together uh, and uh, uh, Jim uh, also talked about uh, coronary reaccess uh, in uh, Tavar population. So, Jim, uh, uh, take it away. Thanks so much, Raj. I, I really appreciate it. Can you hear me okay? We hear you perfect. Wonderful. I want to thank you. It's, it's a real privilege to be here, particularly with a lot of this esteemed faculty. I also want to thank you uh, for this very encouraging uh, conference, particularly in the setting of this environment. It's great to continue to exchange ideas. So, thank you very much. Um, I, as he said, I'm going to speak about the protection of coronaries uh, and re, um, reaccessing the coronaries after TAVR. This is kind of a topic that's near and dear to me. Um, to try to cover them both in 15 minutes is difficult, but we're going we're to at least touch on the high points here. Starting with, with protection of coronaries, why do we care? Uh, we know that uh, you know, less than 1%, uh, if you look at native coronary or native TAVR, uh, somewhere around 0.5%, 0.4.5%, you can have coronary occlusion. When we first started doing this, before valve and valve was really well known several years ago, it was actually thought that valve and valve would be protective against coronary occlusion, but we actually now know that's not the case, and that if you, depending on what you look at, there's about a 4% chance of coronary occlusion with valve and valve as opposed to around 0.4 if you're looking at native. So we're talking about a tenfold increase. 
What's the mechanism? Uh, usually it's gonna be displacement of the leaflet over the coronary ostium. Of course, there are other things that can happen. Impingement of the coronary ostium by a uh, scaffold or leaflet. I know that's happened. I, I saw a case, I talked with a, a team down in Atlanta that had this. And you can also seal off the sinotubular junction, a uh, case that I'll show, which is more common with valve and valve tavern. What happens? Unfortunately, it's usually acute hemodynamic compromise. So can't we predict it? The answer is yeah, kinda. Um, if you look at natives, you know, most of us use a number of around 10%. If you look at the real literature, it would say that around 12, or excuse me, 10, 10 millimeters. And if you look at the literature, it'd say around 12 millimeters is around your, your more predictive height to not have coronary occlusion. Of course, the coronary height's not the only thing you look at. The sign of, of Valsalva, if you're looking at less than 30 millimeters, depending on your valve size, you start to think about it, and a low sinotubular junction. So basically, we take a look at the whole anatomy, and you kind of look, as, you, as most of you know, if you prop this leaflet up, are you going to be at risk of occluding the coronary or not? In this situation up here on top, you look at very low risk. However, down here at the bottom, you'd be at a very high risk. I'd say I would plan on this being occluding the coronary unless you have some type of protective or preventive strategy. Can we predict it with valve and valve? I'd say, yes, this is the majority. This, uh, every case that I've ever seen has been with valve and valve tabber. This comes from Danny DeVere and, and his uh, colleagues work looking at how do we predict this? Um, and as opposed to looking at coronary height, we're typically looking at the distance or the valve to coronary distance, as you can see here. What you see in these three illustrations are three roots. These two on the, the, the one on the left and the one in the middle are the same root. And if you can see here, if you put in a new valve, a transcatheter valve inside the surgical bioprosthesis, you prop up the existing surgical leaflets to make a cylinder. And you can see here that with this alignment of the surgical valve that's there, you have some degree of a gap here. However, with the same anatomy right over here, you can see that one factor we have to take into account is when, this, when the surgical valve is placed, it's not always in alignment with the ascending aorta. And so you can actually have it to where it's canted one way or the other. Here you can see that with the same anatomy, different alignment of the surgical valve places you at much higher risk of coronary occlusion. And then, of course, if you look over here on the right, you can see that this is just a patient who has a, who has a very non-capacious route. You can see that you're at very high risk regardless, unless you do some type of preventive strategy. Um, so how do we predict it looking at it? So CAT scan is the most preferred means, but there's one way I still like to do very frequently. Again, this is, was demonstrated by Dr. DeVere. And this is uh, looking at, you can see here, this is a sore and mitral flow valve, and this is during heart catheterization. Now, when I do my uh, pre uh, taber coronary angiography, uh, when I do normal angiography, I don't routinely do an LAO cranial view, but when it comes to pre taber with a valve and valve, I virtually always do. For this view right here, to isolate the, the coronary, as you can see, if you look up in A and B, if you look and you propped up this leaflet to here, you're gonna be hard pressed to occlude that coronary. You're at very low risk here. However, if you can see this cylinder that I drew, this kind of imaginary cylinder, you can see that this leaflet, if you prop it up here, you're at very high risk. I would say you're gonna occlude that coronary unless you do some type of planning or preventative strategy. Similarly, down here in ENF, you can see that you're at high risk for coronary occlusion also. But most of us use CAT scan uh, for this. And as you can see here, this is just a simple example doing the same idea. You're gonna take the, the surgical leaflets, make a virtual cylinder, go to the top of that cylinder, which is right here. And you can see what's the distance here. And we can see a distance here of right around two millimeters. Uh, the original paper looking at this said less than three, three or less was high risk of occlusion, four to six was moderate, greater than six was low. I think most of us now look around four millimeters as our kind of cut off of being, having angst about coronary occlusion or not. But you can see here, this is a very high risk of coronary occlusion, two millimeters. This one right here, you're at exceedingly low risk. It'd be difficult to occlude this coronary as you're, almost, as you're approaching 10 millimeters in distance from your virtual uh, valve out to the coronary ostium. So how do we protect it? Now, there are a lot of ways to do that. Let me be clear about this. I'm going to show you the way we do that. There are a lot of various ways, but I'll give a little rationale on how our team has done this and, and our experience with it. Um, first, you know, as you can see here, we've defined the anatomy. Our typical strategy uh, would be to place a wire, place a 30 by 20 balloon, and place a guide extension catheter in here to protect this. There are various reasons for this, uh, which I'll go into, but as you can see here, regardless of the valve platform you're using, self-expanding, balloon expandable, as you can see here, this is a, is a Sapien series. And we go ahead and expand. And you can see, again, I have a, a typical guide. I have a, a workhorse wire, a 30 20 balloon, and a guide extension catheter here. Um, I kind of jokingly say that because I took the time to plan for it, of course, the coronary didn't occlude. But as you can see, as the balloon goes up, we don't see any divot in our guide extension catheter or wire suggesting there was no impingement. But of course, before we come back, I'll take a quick picture. I still have a balloon and wire in. 
And so that, you know, you can see there's good flow. You could argue maybe that's propping up the leaflet. So I pull back typically until the radio opaque part is in and take a look confirming that we have no obstruction of flow. So as a step-by-step -step here, um, what guiders do we use? Usually it's about support and leverage. Uh, I, I will almost always use a JL, either JL three and a half or JL four. Um, and the reason is, is not because I think it's such a supporting catheter. Um, I, I almost never use these catheters for typical PCI. I think most of us use something that gives some good contralateral support like an EDU or an XP. The problem is when you use a have a transcatheter valve, you have now removed that leverage because you cannot go from under the valve, under the coronary ostomy, you have to come from above it. And that's why we found that trying multiple guiders, this is what typically works. I know, I know a lot of them uh, use a CARI for the similar approach and that it's kind of a, a lateral approach into the ostium as opposed to coming up from below. Um, but we use a workhorse wire, mine's a BMW Universal, but that's not specific, a guide extension catheter and a 3020 balloon. One of the reasons for this, I don't, I've had times where I needed a stent and the one I would have picked would have been the wrong one based on the anatomy. And so it's, it's cost effective, but also I'll show you why this technique has worked very well for us. Um, similarly with the right, we'll typically use a JR4 unless it's a downward taking ostium, in which case I'll use a multi-purpose uh, guider. So yeah, but that's a sapien valve. Everybody knows it's impossible to protect the coronaries with an evolute. So this is a case, actually. This is a very difficult case. Uh, this was a 92-year-old woman who had a, she'd had a 19-millimeter mitroflow valve uh, that was failing. Um, we had talked about, you know, what are the options? She was 92 and going to be a redo. Nobody was keen on the idea of redo surgery. Uh, we were, of course, uh, concerned for a high risk of uh, patient prosthesis mismatch. If you don't know, if you're not familiar with a 19-millimeter mitroflow valve, the inner diameter is 15.4 millimeters. But I was also concerned about coronary occlusion. If you look over here, this is the distance to the left coronary, six millimeters. You say, well, I, I thought we weren't worried about that. Well, I wasn't about that, but I was worried about sequestering this sinus right here, excuse me, on this layer here in the middle. I was really worried that this leaflet was gonna occlude this sinus. So we prepared for it. Uh, you can see here, um, now given our concern for patient prosthesis mismatch, we did do a pre-dilatation with a, with a bioprosthetic valve fracture. But I have a wire down, uh, same technique as always. Um, we come down with, uh, you can see here, the balloon coming down. You can see the guide extension catheter coming in. I don't ram it down there. I just put it to where it's there. It's more, it's certainly more accommodating and floppy than your guide catheter. So it mitigates your risk of coronary dissection. I do remove the guides when we go up with the valve. So like I said, we did the bioprosthetic valve fracture. Uh, as Dr. Adazani had said, we're, we're particular, uh, we're, we're cautious about our depth. I actually thought this depth was too low. I really did try to go higher depth. And so you can see here, I was very happy with our depth uh, and we were happy with our deployment there on the right. And we were uh, kind of congratulating each other when her blood pressure started to drop. We noticed by echo that her anterior and lateral walls started to, uh, to, to become hypokinetic. So I took a quick shot here and you can see on the right that yes, there's flow down the coronary because I have a guide extension catheter there, but there's not one drop of blood going backwards. So we had completely sequestered that sinus and there was no longer flow going to the left main system. So having done this method before, we were pretty confident that we could pull back. Um, let me go back there, sorry about that. That we could pull back our guide extension catheter um, and then we could dilate and get an idea what's going on. And so that's what I did. Uh, I could see the picture here and if you look on the left, what you can see is that now there's some flow, it's not great flow, but basically we had occluded that entire sinus. And so I would have originally planned to put my stent here, but I now know I need to come back further. So I dilated it, I put a stent in, and uh, you can see you can see the stent here anyway, but it came back to about here. Now we have excellent flow. Immediately the blood pressure came back up, immediately everything normalized, the birds started chirping and everything was good again. And this was something that, that really without preparation could have been a very harrowing situation, but within a couple of minutes we had a we had very we had excellent control of the situation. Uh, she was discharged soon thereafter and, and continues to do well uh, more than a year out. So yeah, but that's before TAVR. Everybody knows it's harder to reaccess the coronaries after TAVR. So this this is a slide I call my Me Too slide. Uh, the, this is one that I know that if you look at the evolute valve obligatorily, you're going to be occluding or excuse me crossing the coronaries with the cage. Um, and this is just to show that, yes, it can happen with the other cage, but honestly, it's, it's far rarer, obviously, when it happens. And uh, this is something that's of far less concern unless you're going to cross the cage. Obviously, when the, when the valve is below the coronary ostium, you just engage it directly. But we'll talk a little about what you do when you have to go through the cage, regardless of the valve platform. 
So is this a big deal? Are we making a, a mountain out of a mole here? Here, how, how often are we going to have to get back in the coronaries? This to me is one of the most telling papers. This was published in 2018 from Dr. Vallalta's group. And they looked at their own experience over 10 years. They looked at, they had, they followed 779 patients over 10 years, average follow-up just over two years at 25 months. And they found that 78 of them came back with acute coronary syndrome. That's 10%. And how, how did they present? About a third of them with unstable angina, two thirds with end STEMI, over a percent, 1.3% with STEMI. So this is a real problem that's only gonna get bigger as we delve into younger and younger patients. What's our success with this? Angiography, if you look at studies, somewhere between 95 to 100%. If you look at PCI success rates, it ranges from 91 to 100% with an average of 94. While that looks fairly promising, most of us would not be happy with a success rate of 94% with PCI. So how do you do it? Well, if you're gonna get through the cage, what's the best practices if you have to go through this cage? And so what's recommended is you go on this sweet spot here. If you look at most of the valves, there's 13 to 14 millimeters of skirt from the bottom up to the third node. And if you go from here to the narrowest part of a cage, this is the sweet spot that can accommodate up to a 10 French catheter and where you're encouraged to engage the coronary. So what are the actual best practices here? Number one, identify the coronaries. I don't know if you can see it there, but you can see the left main coming off over here. Number two, cannulate through the middle of the frame, as you can see here. Number three, go ahead and put a wire, uh, advance through, use an extension catheter if you need. In this situation, you don't. Put a, put a stent up, and then as you're done, sorry about that, as you're done, you can see that they're pulling the wire back, and our, you know, the case is completed and, and no problems there. But what's the issue here? Look at the implantation depth. This is a depth that originally most of us were taught on, which much lower. Most of us would not find this depth of over 12 on that cusp to be acceptable anymore. So this standard technique may not always be applicable as we're imply implanting our, 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 at least our self-expanding valves higher and higher. So this is a case, um, this is one of uh, looking at how to reaccess with any valve. So this is a, a mitroflow valve. And before you judge too much, this was back in late 2015. And we are just starting to get some data that, you know what, valve and valve may pose a higher risk for coronary occlusion. So we talked about this and I said, you know, are we, are we going to be in trouble here? Do we need to do something? And my surgeon said, look, you know, I, I know the data they're saying, but the reality is how I put, and he's an excellent surgeon. He said, hey, you know, how I put the valve in, you, this valve will protect the coronaries. And we can't occlude a coronary. So I said, that's great. So we put the valve in. And unfortunately, it was exactly right. We did not occlude a coronary. We occluded both coronaries. Um, and I can tell you that the patient uh, rapidly becomes unstable in that situation. Uh, so we realized we had work to do. You'll notice there's a new piece of equipment right here. This is a, the inflow cannula for ECMO. I would say that the first step, if you haven't predicted this, which I, I hope after this talk you would, is that you, uh, you get stability in the situation. So we put the patient on ECMO. I went in with a guider and I, I, I noticed the right had some flow to it. So I went into the left and I could see this looked to be the problem. The problem is all the conventional teaching I'd had to access the left main was not applicable here. I couldn't use the typical guiders that would come in with an approach from below through. I had to come from above. And so I tried every technique I could think of. I tried a multi-purpose. I could get no support. So ultimately I was left with a, with a JL guider sitting right there. And I'd use some techniques that I used in, in chronic total occlusion world. I had to use some stiffer wires. This was a Pilot 200, a four gram jacketed wire. And I had a, a uh, you can see a microcatheter behind this, this being a turnpike. And I was able to get past this with very little support. Once I got in, I couldn't pass a stent by it. It kept catching on the cage. There was no way to get by the steric interaction. So I was able to pass a balloon, inflate the balloon. And then for, once I could pass the balloon, I could slide the guide extension or buy it. We call that inch warming, slide the guide extension catheter past it, deliver a stent there. And then from there I could inflate. And knew, here I knew I was in business. Um, it looks like it's narrowed there. I did Ivis it, it's oblong. There was a very wide diameter on one side. It was, it was narrower, but still a large area. Uh, the patient did much better after that. Unfortunately, the next day we tried to take the patient off of ECMO, uh, but you can see that when we did, the right ventricle was very punky. The patient started doing well, poorly. We brought her back to the lab and took a look, and we could see here that the right coronary, while it had it transiently opened, had now occluded. And this is why now we treat all risk of coronary occlusion like a dissection flap. If there's any chance that it can occlude, we treat it. We don't wait for it to declare itself. So as you can see here, in this situation, similar situation, very little support when you're trying to get in from above. I used a multi-purpose catheter and I tried the same technique. Essentially, I took a stiff wire. I took a, a guide or a, a, a micro catheter behind it, came in. I was able to trade out for a routine wire like a BMW. Again, I could not pass a stent, but I could pass a balloon. With the balloon, I could then deliver a guide extension catheter, again, using inchworming. And once I had this, I knew I had the case. 
So I was able to, to put the stent there, deploy as you see, and then reestablish flow. Uh, the next day we were able to get her off ECMO. Three days later, she was walking. Although I, I, it's, uh, it was a very harrowing experience. Fortunately, uh, we were able to regain access. So you say, yeah, but that's a sapien valve and that's a unique situation. Let's be clear. That's one that, that, that in hindsight could be predicted now with our current techniques and also that's a very unique situation. But everybody knows that it's more common and more difficult to get through the coronaries through a core valve. So this is a typical case we had. This is a person we'd done a TAVR on two years earlier who presented to one of our outside hospitals, our satellites. And he said, hey, look, she came in with acute coronary syndrome and he showed me this picture. And I said, he said, can I send her to you? I said, yes, this doesn't look really good. So we brought her back and said, according to breast practices, what should we do? Well, number one, identify the coronary takeoffs. Check. Number two, cannulate the ostium through the middle of the frame, as you can see right here. So one quick word on that. Uh, when you're looking at the valve here, it's real easy to see the valve and to see the bioprosthetic leaflets there. But in fluoroscopy, you don't see it. And so I, I think this is probably the most important part in getting to is making sure your catheter's in the right place and not entangled with the valves. And so how does that look? It looks like something like this here. This is me in real time, just probing with a typical J wire. Nope, nope, that would be pretty good for the right. Boom, that's the look you want. I now am down near the sinus I want to be. I've laid down the leaflet and now I can approach knowing I won't be entangled with the leaflet. Now, I can't promise it's perfectly aligned, but I can tell you I'm now in the area and I can get access. I'll just show you similarly without the, the, the leaflet being marked. This is just for, again, that would be good for the right. That's good for the left right there. Once you've done that, we've kind of come down and engaged into it. I'll typically we use a wire to just gently ease across like that, and then I'll, I'll advance the catheter through. Now I took a picture here and we fill it well, but we weren't perfectly lined up. And that's for a reason that Dr. Yada, I think just mentioned was that we, we could have had a post there, but this isn't, this isn't problematic, we can work around it. Uh, my partner didn't like it, we wanted to try another guider. We switched out to an EBU, which again, I can tell you in our experience is not as favorable, but we were you know, early on with this. Ultimately, we were able, we couldn't get it to go through like a JL would, but was still able to access with a wire. Um, and then from here, we talked about the post being in the way. In truth, it's really not a problem. We put an eight French guide extension catheter through. We did that. We took a picture. We could see that there was clearly, this was a Medina 111, unfortunately. Uh, we thought it would need roto. You are able to do rotational atherectomy with a 1.5 birth through an eight millimeter guide extension catheter. And then we proceeded with bifurcation stenting, um, and to which uh, we had an excellent result and the patient did very well. So now that I know these techniques, I can fix any coronary after TAVR, right? Um, well, let me show you this one. <laughs> this is your typical case of an Evolute inside a uh, S3, inside a mitral flow valve that's undergone bioprosthetic valve expansion uh, or valve fracture with an, imp with an impella in place. <laughs> before, uh, before anybody wants to call the police, let me at least explain how we got here. So this is a patient who had had a, a mitral flow valve, 21 millimeter mitral flow valve, and we had, this is, we had put in a 20 millimeter S3. This was earlier on in our experience of this, and yes, ultimately the patient developed higher gradients. And whether you believe they're real or not, within about 18 months, um, unfortunately, this was prior to bioprosthetic valve fracture, the patient had gradients that were now approaching the 40s and she was getting symptomatic again. So we talked about a strategy to do this. I was talking to one of my good friends and colleagues, Dr. Adnan Chaturwala. He and I know Keith Allen were, were, have been pioneers with bioprosthetic valve fracture. And I said, you know, the idea was, you know, you know, this valve isn't that old. I wonder if we can just expand the valve without putting another valve in. This hadn't been tried before. So we said, you know, we think we'd try that. So we did. Unfortunately, what we learned was that, particularly with an undersized S3 inside it, uh, when you accommodate for valve expansion, the valve, as you can see, kind of shrunk down long before the bioprosthetic valve fracture occurred. Unfortunately, as, as we did not expect, uh, there was significant AI and the patient did not, was not doing well hemodynamically. So we very rapidly came through, put another valve inside, um, did it quickly, um, ultimately gave, uh, did give, I think, around 200 mics of epinephrine. And within a few, within about, you know, 30 seconds after putting this valve in, as you can see on the right, the, uh, the blood pressure, I'll just show you the valve deployment there. We did it fairly quickly. Uh, the blood pressure came back up, blood pressure 120 or 180s. Everything is going well. We're very, we're, everything's getting better. But as the blood pressure started to drift down, the, all of a sudden the ST started to drop and the blood pressure then started to drop again as well. And you can see here what I missed at the time. This looks like a, there's this hypo, this lucency, radio lucency. I'll show another better view. We took some pictures. Yes, there was flow there, but you could still see this radio lucency, which frankly at the time we saw it, but we had flow down the coronaries. And our assumption was it must be that that hit that the LV had taken because of the impella 
uh, or excuse me, because of the AI must mean that it's, it's having trouble overcoming this situation. So our decision was to put an impella in, which is what we did and let the patient rest for a day. And the patient did very well with this. So the next day I went to take the impella out. I turned it down to P3 or P4 and immediately the STs dropped and the blood pressure started dropping. So I turned it back up, dropped a TEE probe and found that the anterior and lateral walls were failing, were, were becoming hypokinetic each time. So, so I said, this has got to be left main occlusion, the impella, which decreases LVDP, which, uh, which improves your uh, wall tension and increases your diastolic flow was mitigating the ischemia caused by the leaflet. And when we turned it down, we discovered that. So I brought it back to the lab and this is what we saw. And you can still see this radiolucency of the leaflet here. So according to best practices, what should I do? Uh, well, number one, identify the takeoff, check. Number two, access the osteum through the middle of the frame. So that's what I did right about here. So I put a guider in there and I was trying to get down to it and there's no, there's a complete disadvantage mechanically on this. I was trying with every wire I knew, BMW, Whisper, Pilot 200, but as you can see here on the right, all that happened was I was prolapsing my wire. Uh, so what did I do? So, so what was the problem here? The problem was I was trying to go like this, then down, then this. Now I was an engineering student in undergrad and I can tell you that your mechanical advantage exponentially decreases as your angle of attack increases. I had no pushability here. So we thought this isn't gonna work. What are we gonna do? What if we could attack this target from a near parallel angle, somewhere like that? And then maybe get behind it with a support catheter so we can give us some mechanical advantage here. So that's what I tried. So I put a JL in there. I immediately came down with a wire and a turnpike catheter behind it and watch what happened. Boom, just a little bit of mechanical advantage. And now I'm already wiring down there in the coronary. And I put an extension catheter behind it. Now I expected the advantage with the angle. What I didn't expect is when I put a little push on it, this would start to look like an, a lot like an AL3 and I'd have some real legitimate support. So I drove a micro catheter through it. I had a similar situation where I could not pass a stent, but I could put a balloon and push my extension catheter through it. From here, I was able to deliver a stent. You can see both on the left and the right here. All I wanted to do was make sure I had flu uh, blood flow up into the sinus. And this was the final result. Uh, the next day I had her impella out. She was extubated soon thereafter and she went home in three days. Um, I will tell you that her, as it turns out in hindsight, her, her, it was a small world. Her daughter delivers my mail and uh, left a very nice note. So, uh, but the, the point being here is that this technique we've shown, I won't go through any more examples of it due to time, but, but this has been shown to be a reproducible in our small series that we're actually have submitted for publication. So what's the answer here? You showed me in this one, you got this coronary takeoff here, and yet here you say the answer is here. Well, which is it? Do you go from above or do you go straight at it? Well, the answer is both. If you have a takeoff like this, where the coronary osteum is below your sweet spot on the skirt, then you're going to want to come from above so you have a mechanical advantage and you can access it. However, if your access site is here or anywhere at your sweet spot or higher, then you can access it directly to it. So in conclusion, I have none. I can tell you though that predict, what I think is that prediction of coronary occlusion during TAVR is difficult. I can tell you utilization of extension catheter or the coronary balloon for protection during TAVR reduces your risk of hemodynamic collapse, reduces the risk of coronary trauma and allows for predictable protection of coronary um, arteries during, any, uh, during TAVR with any transcatheter or heart valve. I can tell you it's less expensive than placing a stent uh, due to, uh, and, uh, and also helps with your ability uh, to, um, to predict the right length of stent or not have the ability to the difficulty pulling it out. What do I think about re-engagement? I can tell you it's very patient specific. I can tell you utilizing a fluoroscopic angle orthogonal to the coronary osteum, which is almost always iliocranial, helps to achieve catheter engagement. I can tell you that choosing an angle of catheter engagement that offers a straight approach to coronary osteum greatly increases your mechanical advantage for traversing a lesion. So the utilization of extension catheter greatly increases your odds of excess through pushability, deliverability of equipment, and gives you more support when you have to go through a transcatheter heart valve frame. Um, I, will, uh, I will, for sake of time, I will, I've already gone over these, but what I will tell, I'll leave you with one of my favorite quotes, and that comes from cowboy lore. Good judgment comes from experience. Most of that comes from bad judgment. I'm happy to, to discuss this. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, presentation. Uh, outstanding cases, uh, great uh, uh, learning uh, in uh, some of these techniques. I certainly am going to put into my practice in uh, future whenever I need to go back in for uh, coronary access. Um, I've been uh, keeping uh, Dr. Didi Bang uh, on hold. Uh, she is a, um, uh, a superb uh, uh, cardiologist at Henry Ford Hospital in uh, 
Detroit, Michigan, uh, who has very kindly been waiting uh, to do her talk. And she has another engagement uh, later uh, uh, today. Uh, so thanks uh, for uh, your patience. But she's going to talk about uh, Valin Val, uh, Valin Dream, and Valin Mac, understanding the left ventricular outflow track. Thank you very much. All right, let me get you started here. Uh, share my screen. Can you see my screen okay? Yep, we see it fine. All right, wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Dave. I uh, really appreciate it. So we're going to focus in the next 10 minutes understanding the left ventricular outflow tract and transcatheter mitral valve replacement. These are my disclosures. So the goals are going to be understanding the mechanism of transcatheter mitral valve replacement outflow tract obstruction and really addressing when and where to measure the cardiac cycle of mitral valve replacement. So we're switching it up from transcatheter aortic valve implantation. And we really want to then discuss the limitations of current planning for transcatheter mitral valve technology and accept what we do not know. So when we start with the valve and valve, valve and ring, valve and neck, it's very similar to doing transcatheter aortic valve. We have to understand the landing zone. So on your far right, the left atrium is at 12 p.m., the left ventricle is at 6 p.m., the aorta is at 2 p.m. We have to understand the mechanism of anchoring and risk for embolization. Each of these differs for a valve and valve, valve and ring, or a valve and mitral inner calcification. The second part is the fit test, wondering where is the ventricular portion of the device going to hit? Because unlike the aorta, the actual mitral annulus has a ventricular portion that has to fit a device, and there's no tube for it. The last part we have to think about is actually leak and interference. So these are the three components you want to think about before doing outflow tract obstruction. The mechanism of anchor is very important because when you're sizing a valve and ring or a valve and valve or a valve and mass, there are different devices available. In the U.S., we're available to sapiens off-label for valve and ring and valve and mass. Valve and valve is commercially available. We have clinical trials for a 10 9 transit device and also other clinical trial devices such as the Apollo and uh, Tierra 2. So, like in some devices, you actually need to have an entry mechanism on the far left with the arrow. On the far right, the valve might not need that. So, in this patient on the left, a device will not anchor or likely embolize. Patient on the right, you need a device that's actually trapezoidal in shape to actually have a flare in the LV so there's no embolization. Each of these affects the LVOT differently, and the LVOT actually is not symmetrical in every single patient. Every single patient's LVOT is like a fingerprint with a different angulation, different turn, and different basal septal hypertrophy, too. So when we're putting a valve in, the actual impact of this on each patient will have to be individually managed and assessed, too. This is what we have in the U.S. commercially at APN3. The current problem we have off-label use is that it's only a one-shot attempt. We can't remobilize these devices. Once it's implanted, it's actually stuck in the heart. So what are the mechanisms of outflow tract obstruction that we actually worry about? One is the TMVR frame. Just like Dr. Harvey's excellent talk earlier with cavern and coronary reinclusion, the TMVR frame is an upside-down cavern valve. So on the far left, I have a beautifully implanted non-embolized valve, but the problem is that has complete outflow obstruction. And if we do kissing balloons trying to open that up and open the outflow tract, even the aorta, nothing happens. On day three on the right is a patient with the autopsy. As you can see, the neo LVOT is in black. So the concept is this flame can cause outflow obstruction. But the other problem with this is that we can also have outflow obstruction from the native anterior mitral leaflet. So as Toby's gonna talk about this later with anterior leaflet resections and anterior leaflet lacerations, when you put a valve into a native apparatus, valve and ring, or a valve and mat, the native anterior mitral leaflet, which is depicted in the white arrow, can actually cause outflow obstruction because the actual transcatheter valve is actually being used as a curtain against it. This actually has to be taken into account in those two devices, but not so much in valve and valve. Another mechanism is actually going to be chordal and leaflet and capillary muscle intervention. So on this patient on the far left, you can see that they have an elongated anterior mitral leaflet, much longer than the frame of a transcatheter heart valve that will be implanted. And in this patient, that can also cause permanent anterior motion. And additionally, with uh, chordal apparatus too, that will cause outflow obstruction. Not all outflow obstruction is also caused by just the leaflet. On the patient on the far left and the patient on the far right, there's just a one-month difference in time frame. And systolic anterior motion can be a problem after we put a mitral valve in, too. When we're planning for outflow obstruction, you want to do patients who actually have normal renal function. 
If they are a dialysis patient, you actually want to scan the patient after they have had dialysis so their left ventricle is smallest and the worst case scenario. This patient on the left, immediately after transcaster mitral valve replacement, did wonderful, but they went into renal failure afterwards. On the right is them actually coming in a month later after dialysis and now having cyclops anterior motion acquired mechanically because of dialysis and dehydration. Those are all things you want to consider because the neo LVOT with the alpha construction now is a new concept. It's unlike the aorta we're doing in LVOT area. Anywhere along the transcaster mitral valve frame in yellow, we can have outflow obstruction. The worst case scenario that we look at is in the red arrow when we're looking at specifically the smallest area of orifice too. So it's not your traditional echo definition. It's not your traditional tablet definition. It's completely different. So when we implanted the first valve in MAP in 2013, first in human, we were very lucky. Since then, we had critical outflow obstructions, and we wanted to find out how to validate it and how to prove how low can we go. We also developed ideas about finding what the neo LVOT is and mechanisms to actually see how can we predict and find out who's going to be at the highest risk. So in 2017, in a 35 patient study, we found that a neo LVOT cutoff less than 190 was where we're going to see a gradient change about 10 millimeters of mercury pre and post. 10 millimeters of mercury is actually what the mitral valve consortium um, is actually consisting of for stating a failure of mitral valve surgery. So we use that for transcaster mitral valve replacement too. Now, in traditional hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, 10 milliliters of mercury is actually not clinically significant. But what you can notice is that there's a steep step off after less than 190, depending on how we actually implant the valve, then we could have a greater gradient. When we do a pigtail catheter gradient to the neo LVOT by CT, you can see in the far left, when we have a neo LVOT less than 60, obviously we're going to have critical outflow obstruction with a peak to peak gradient of over 80. On the far right, when the neo LVOT is greater than 300, we have no gradient by peak to peak. The importance of this is as we get close to 200 and under 190, any slight angulation, slippage of the valve and chip early will cause an exponential increase in the outflow gradient and high risk for outflow obstruction, which is fatal in most patients. We also did analysis on the pre-CT and the post-CT on these patients, and we found that they were concurrent, that all the CTs actually correlated between the pre and the post needed the in-valve implantation. The difference was that we had a few outliers, and we couldn't understand why that was the case because we thought we had a game changer understanding of neo LVOT prediction modeling for TMDR. <clears throat> well, we'll address that here shortly. There are also questions about how do you start actually doing the mitral valve assessment and when do you do the measurement, the output tract in the neo LVOT, and how to size. For purposes of sizing, we do it in diastole because that's when the mitral annulus is biggest. But for purposes of LVOT obstruction, we analyze it mid to in systole. Mid to in systole is the echocardiographic definition, not CT definition. So here you see three different patients on a different row. In cardiac cycles between 0 and 45, that definition is systole. 55 is diastole. So you always want to see if the aortic valve is opening or not. The other thing is you want to look at the basal septal hypertrophy protrusion which is always different in every single patient. And that might happen anywhere between mid to in systole. You want to find it specifically for that patient. You don't want to chance it and do it in early systole. What are the limitations, though, of the current TMVR technology? We showed you that we can actually do pre neo LVT prediction modeling with a cutoff of 190. We showed you that we can actually correlate pre and post CT. But I also mentioned there's actually outliers. And it's not comfortable to have outliers because we want to have an answer. Well, there are things that we can do to have outliers to actually cure them. We can do alcohol self-regulation, glaceration of the anterior mitral leaflet. We can figure out that we can scan patients earlier so we have no pre- and post neo lvot gradient. But the most important thing is we have to understand the design of every single transcaster mitral valve frame. The deformation of each clinical trial device and the way the vortices work on each device is not the same. From an M3 to an intrepid to a caisson to a tendine, the neo LVOT is different, and the actual way the blood flows to the orifice of each diamond shape is also different, too. As you can see, the intrepid device, the valve is actually on the interior, and the exterior frame is what is being measured, which may not actually apply to the current neo LVOT, which is for sapien valve. The other limitation is our understanding of neo LVOT is very limited. It's actually not symmetrical. So here, the left ventricle is at 6 p.m., left atrium is at 12 p.m. If I zoom in for the actual LVOT and pop it out for you, it's an amorphous structure. 
And all the external forces are not going to be equivalent when you put a valve in here. And the actual flow and velocity is going to be different at different points in the LVOT. What happens when cardiac contractility is also very important. So on the far left is the three chamber view of the heart. Not everybody contracts in the vagal anterior after a while. Some are posterior. So if I actually put a valve in here, that's going to be pushed forward into the indication and higher risk for contractility and alcohol obstruction. This patient also has a higher contractility from lateral to medial. Gray is diastole, red is actually simply. And if I look at this patient from a medial lateral view from the foot of the patient up, the heart also contracts from actually 7 p.m. and going all the way to 2 p.m. So we have three different methodologies of contractility in the heart and the twisting motion of the venturi forces that all need to be accounted for when we're doing LVOT modeling. So our LVOT modeling currently is still insufficient. What else do we need to understand? The LVOT anatomy is actually extremely different. Patient on the far left has a 9 p.m. to 3 p.m. projection of the outflow tracks, and the aorta is coming straight off. Patient in the middle is going from a 7 p.m. to 2 p.m. projection, and the aorta actually turns and twists and has more of an angulation. Patient on the far right has severe basal antisocial hypertrophy with a narrow aorta, and they have a homograph in their aorta. So their neo LVOT, despite what we do with putting a valve here, is going to be unaffected because they're going to have an outflow gradient because they had an undersized homograph that was put in surgically. Having all these concepts is important, but then we also have to think about positioning. When we go in by a transeptal or transapical approach, we assume the valve is going to go 12 to 6 p.m. So the valve can actually go from 10 p.m. to 4 p.m. and tilt. That may or may not be favorable for that patient's anatomy. And the patient on the far right, as you can see, if we actually make any kind of error, there's going to be critical outflow obstruction. But anticipating the TMVR position in transeptal or transapical approach is critical also to LVOT planning. So really thinking about this, this is the left ventricle, left atrium, the aorta. As I turn it around, you see the heart is not symmetrical structure. It is actually not in the ripple. But on the far left in it is what we commonly think about what the heart looks like. I think it's just actually equivalent on the medial and lateral walls and that it goes around and becomes a globular mass. If we understand more of the asymmetry of this heart and when we plan work to account for these changes, not accounting for renal failure or any remodeling the LV will be safer as doing TMVR planning. So in conclusion, there is a validated tool for doing LVOT prediction modeling. A neo LVOT less than 190 should sound the alarm for thinking about alternative measures such as alcohol self-ablation or laceration or preemptive interventions or surgical interventions that rule the anterior leaflet. The left ventricle and the alpha tracks are fingerprints. They're not symmetrical, and every patient needs to be uniquely um, evaluated. And not all trans-cathometric values devices are designed the same way. So from the engineering background, we need to understand the limitations of each device and whether or not certain neo lbt modeling phases account for that device's design. We're still learning cardiac anatomy, CT, and echo, and swallow. Um, patient safety should be first. We definitely do not want to be complacent in trans mitral valve placement. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Didi. That was a fabulous uh, presentation. Uh, we'll continue to uh, keep you involved uh, in our uh, online virtual uh, structural heart ball uh, series. Uh, I know you have another engagement, so I'm going to uh, let you go. Thanks again. Uh, now I'll introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Toby Rogers uh, from um, Washington Hospital Center. He's a, a structural interventionist uh, and a, a superb uh, 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 operator. Uh, he's going to talk about electro uh, surgery or electro uh, for a TAVR uh, uh, in a transcable access as well as a basilica uh, procedure. Uh, Toby, uh, take it away. Thank you very much. It's uh, an honor to be, uh, to be part of this meeting. Um, I can address these two procedures which uh, fall under the umbrella of electrosurgery. Both have been mentioned before, but hopefully I can give a little bit more detail um, for the attendees. So these are my disclosures. So transcable, as we discussed before, the concept is to bypass the ephemeral arteries, connect through the inferior vein cava to the aorta to deliver large devices such as TAVR. And the, we all worry about with this procedure, but the reason it doesn't happen is because in the retroperitoneal space, these vessels are surrounded by fluid, which sits at slightly higher pressure. So what we'd expect to happen when you make a hole in the aorta, which is bleeding like this, in this model, 
uh, you'll see when there is slightly higher pressure surrounding the two vessels, blood preferentially decompresses from the aorta into the cava and doesn't collect in the retroperitoneum. And this is the physiology that we rely on during transcaval and that makes this procedure safe and easy. The reason I like it and the reason why transcaval is the preferred alternative access in our center and in, in, in a number of others in the US is because it, from an ergonomics and cath lab perspective, it is exactly the same as transfemoral. If you like transfemoral TAVA, which I'm sure everyone does, then you should like transcaval because nothing changes. Uh, the patient can be under conscious sedation. In fact, most transcaval procedures are performed with conscious sedation. There really isn't re any reason to put your patient to sleep for this procedure. You stand at the groin where you're comfortable, you're far away from the radiation, and it's a transvenous procedure. Patient can be up and about quickly. So it really is a truly percutaneous approach. This slide summarizes the data that we have for transcaval. The best data is from the prospective 100 patient uh, NHLBI sponsored study, uh, which was published a couple of years ago. So it represents early transcaval experience, and I'll show you some more contemporary data in a moment. But essentially, the success rate with transcaval was extremely high 99 out of 100 patients' success or access, TAVA, and closure. And yes, bleeding in this early report was on the high side, but much of it was driven by the fact that every patient had a CT scan before discharge and had some blood in the retroperitoneum. But I would say if we did a CT scan on every patient who had a transfemoral TAVA before discharge, we'd pick up on a lot of blood in the retroperitoneum that we don't appreciate clinically. The big question people also always have is, well, what happens to the fistula that you create uh, after you leave the cath lab? Because in this early experience, again, a considerable proportion of patients had residual fistula. This just shows our early experience with approximately 60% of patients having some residual fistula at exit from the cath lab. And of course, it's important to remember that the AMPLATS devices that we typically use that are off the shelf are not hemostatic. They're designed to be porous and to close over time. We have data on this because we follow those 100 patients. Uh, we published this experience just last year and this slide, whilst busy, shows that we were able to track for almost every single patient the outcomes of what happened with that, that their transcable tract because they underwent CT scan at uh, discharge at 30 days and at one year. Now, and you'll see the majority of patients here uh, were proven occluded uh, at, uh, when, during the one year follow up. And of those that were presumed patent, only a very small number of them were actually confirmed uh, patents at one year and none of them had any heart failure or mortality that we can associate with the, with the persistent fistula and there were no cases of erosion or device migration or any other complication related to the transcable uh, closure device. So we feel very confident that if you're, as long as you're good with the, in the cath lab, you don't have to worry about long-term complications. Let's just put transcaval in context. And this, uh, this data is constantly moving as a series of uh, are reported. But here you can see on the right, the experience with transcaval. Um, and uh, I put here the two papers, both our, our original 100 patient series, and then a more recent publication from Europe of 50 transcaval patients. And you'll see that the length of stay is very good, very low, uh, and consistent with this percutaneous approach with significant reduction in bleeding from the early experience of the transcaval paper uh, NHLBI study of 12% down to just 4% in, in the recent experience in Europe. One signal that has worried me uh, over the last year or two about transaxillary, which as you've seen from prior talks is the sort of more commonest alternate axis, is this consistent signal from various registries for higher stroke. Whereas transcaval, because it is a transfemoral approach and you are approaching the valve around the arch just like you would for a transfemoral, has very low stroke rates, much more uh, in keeping with, uh, with the transfemoral that we all consider to be our default axis. So again, I would say, if you like transfemoral arterial, then really you have to question why you're not doing transcaval as your second axis because it is the most transfemoral-like approach. One way to address uh, bleeding concerns uh, would be a dedicated device. This is one that we helped develop and tested uh, last year. Uh, this was a 96-year-old woman with very small calcified iliac arteries. You see the little device that we used on the left. 
uh, the immediate closure in, on the table in the cath lab and the CT scan on the right of 30 days showing the device in place in the aortic wall. These are the final angiograms in the cath lab for all 12 patients who are in this early feasibility study of this new device. And just three of them had as a, a residual fistula at exit from the cath lab. That's compared that so a 75% immediate hemostasis rate with a better device compared to just a 34% immediate hemostasis with the Amplatz devices that we typically use off the shelf. And at 30 days, all of these uh, fistulae were closed. So we think that you know, whilst we do a very good job now with the off-the-shelf Amplatz device, in the future, dedicated devices could make it easier and more reliable and hopefully reassure people who still worry about transcable bleeding. And just again, to, to, to emphasize, with a dedicated device, we had freedom from VARP2 life-threatening or major bleeding and VARP2 major vascular complications in 100% of patients with only one transfusion that was given in this entire study for, uh, uh, for low hemoglobin unrelated to transcable. So patients started out with low hemoglobin was given a transfusion in the cath lab. So just to summarize, transcable is transfemoral. It is typically performed with conscious sedation. For those of you who like cerebral embolic protection, transcable does not interfere with your uh, access from the, from the neck in the way that, for example, a right axillary access would. Um, it allows you to stay away from the radiation source, it allows rapid ambulation and reduces length of stay in, and there were no vascular, late vascular complications related to closure devices in our long-term follow-up series. Moving on to uh, Basilica, we've discussed this concern of coronary obstruction during valve and valve uh, earlier today. Basilica is a, an approach to split the leaflet of the original valve, be that a surgical valve like you see here, or a native valve that has very long leaflets in a patient with small sinuses and a low coronary. And we believe this is a much more physiological approach than hanging stents out of the coronary. Uh, this movie just illustrates how it works. It's performed through the same axis that you use for your transfemoral tava. We position catheters above and below the, the failing valve, electrify the guide wire to burn through the base of the leaflet, and then re-electrify a guide wire to lacerate the leaflet from base to tip. This is incredibly well tolerated without hemodynamic compromise in the vast majority of patients. And then when we implant a new valve inside, the two halves of the leaflet splay to either side, like the, the curtains at a movie theater, allowing flow through the cells of the transcatheter valve to the coronary, but also importantly, making it much easier, I believe, to get back into that coronary with, uh, with uh, catheters if you need to perform angiography or PCI in the future in a way that a snorkel stent hanging up all the way up behind this uh, transcatheter valve makes it almost impossible to get back into the coronary in the future. We've developed some uh, dedicated guide catheters for Basilica. These are uh, in collaboration with Medtronic. These are available in the United States and beyond. Uh, they are based on the launcher guide catheter range with dedicated shapes based on elephant trunks, hence the name pachyderm, uh, for both the left and the right leaflets. It's very important to plan these procedures carefully and to have the projection angles necessary to be able to visualize the leaflets, just like we plan the angles for implantation of TAVA uh, routinely. This is all planned off the same CT scan that you perform pre-TAVA. There's no need for any additional imaging. You essentially need two views, a side view so you can see the coronary and a front view so that you can ensure that you're in the middle of the leaflet and not after the side by the post. This here is an example of a pachyderm or uh, left catheter positioned in front of the left, uh, left main, so sitting on the leaflet and mitral flow, you see again, this is a valve that doesn't have leaflets, but a little injection through the catheter in the, on the image on the right there shows beautifully how we're sitting right down at the base of the leaflet at the hinge point between the ring and the leaflet. This is an example of the same side and front view angles for a right leaflet using the pachyderm uh, JR4 guide catheter. Once we're happy with the position, we burn through the base of the leaflet. Here you can see this, uh, the energy. So what we've done is connect a bobby to the back end of the guide wire. We're energizing it, burning through the base of the leaflet. And we have a snare ready waiting in the LVOT to, to receive the guide wire. Then we grab the guide wire uh, in the LVOT to create a nice uh, rail so that we now have a wire through the base of the leaflet right in front of the left main uh, in the middle of the leaflet. 
The next step is to create what we call the flying V. This is the cutting surface. So halfway back on the wire, we're going to uh, expose and denude a little part of the guide wire, take off the, uh, the insulating coating. And then with the back of the scalpel, we're gonna kink the guide wire to create a, a, the, the lacerating surface. So it's uh, the denuded part is deep down in the elbow of the guide wire. And this, this, the kink serves two purposes. It helps to seat on the leaflet and it also helps to, uh, to visualize where we denuded the wire once we're back inside the body. So here you can see a setup on the image on the left with our two guiding catheters, basically kissing with the leaflet in between and the V sitting right down on the leaflet. And the next step is we re-energize the guide wire, typically with 70 watts of pure cut energy. We like to flush the guiding catheters with dextrose to, to flush out any ionic conducting solution, be that blood or saline, and then we pull. The important thing here is you're not tearing the leaflet with mechanical force, you're allowing the energy to lacerate and cut the leaflet. So this is not like trying to start a snowblower, you're just holding tension on the leaflet and allowing the energy to do the work for you. And then it's a normal TAVA. And you see in this case, there is, uh, we've got no guiding catheters down, the, uh, no stents prepositioned in the coronaries because we trust that the silica will do the job and will, will, uh, will preserve flow to the coronaries. If you're interested in Basilica, we've published both our experience in a prospective study, but also a detailed sort of how-to of how to analyze the CT and then all of the procedure steps um, so, uh, uh, to, so you can learn more how to do this. So just to summarize, Basilica, coronary destruction is rare, but a catastrophic complication of uh, TAVA, particularly valve and valve TAVA, with mortality rates uh, reported of, uh, in excess of 50%. Uh, Basilica avoids the need for snorkel stenting, which uh, facilitates future access to the coronaries, which I know we're all concerned about. CT planning and the correct cath lab equipment is critical. Uh, and in the United States uh, uh, and in Europe, proctoring is supported by the tab of our manufacturers. So, you know, you don't have to go this alone. Just to my final summary slide, transcatheter electrosurgery gives us a number of new capabilities. We can cross anatomic boundaries, for example, with transcaval. Uh, we can resect and lacerate structures, for example, with silica. We can develop ways to deliver sutures using catheters, which opens up a whole load of new possibilities. And once we cross from one structure to another, we can connect them uh, remotely. Uh, using covered stents and other dedicated devices. So I think this it has a real potential to open up the doors to a whole load of new transcatheter interventions that we haven't even conceived of yet. But transcable Basilica, Lampuna have de demonstrated the versatility of these transcatheter electrosurgical techniques. Again, if you're interested in reading more about sort of wider range, then we recently published a state of the in Jack, uh, which is available online. And thanks again for the invitation. Thank you uh, very much, Toby. Uh, uh, outstanding uh, presentation, lots of learning, uh, phenomenal uh, uh, new techniques. Uh, it really is uh, going to help our field uh, move uh, substantially forward. Uh, so now uh, it's again, uh, thank you very much, Toby. Good, great job. Uh, Dr. Darve, can we take one question? Absolutely, please, go ahead. Toby, this is Pradeep Yadav. Uh, excellent Hi. presentation. Hi, excellent presentation as usual. Question, you know, what's your thought in Basilica and Tavar and Tavar? And I'm sure you're working in your lab behind the scenes getting solution for us. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And we recently published a benchtop uh, experience uh, testing bas uh, Basilica for Tavar and Tavar with whole different combinations of S3 and Evolute, Evolute and S3 and, and every combination you can think of. The simple answer is it, will, it may work for some transcatheter valves, particularly the older transcatheter valves, the early sapiens and maybe the early core valve. Um, but some of the newer dedicated transcatheter valves have much longer, more redundant leaflets and basilica may not be sufficient. I think that in the future, we're gonna to need to work out ways to actually remove leaflets rather than just split them. Um, and then the final component that obviously has been discussed earlier today by some of the, the other speakers is the issue of commercial alignment. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that we still can't control very well with any of our transcatheter valves is the, where the commissures land. And so you could do a beautiful basilica and then drop the commissure of your transcatheter valve right in front of the, uh, the split that you create in your basilica. 
and, and negate any benefits. So I think for me, the take home message right now uh, with Basilica for Tavra and Tavra is maybe in select patients, but I don't think it's the whole solution. And I think we are going to need better solutions uh, for Tavra and Tavra in the future. And that's a challenge to the whole community and to, to, to the industry as well. Definitely, and hopefully the newer generation valves may allow commercial alignment a little bit better than what we have today. Yeah, I, I, mean, I very much agree. I think we all want to be more like our surgeons and, and, and no surgeon, in, you know, with any self-respecting surgeon would dream of implanting a surgical valve and putting a post directly in front of the left main. And I think we should all aspire to be just like our surgeons in the future and we need help with industry to do that. Excellent, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it's a privilege to uh, now uh, invite uh, Pinaksha, who is the director of the Cardiac Cat Lab at Brigham and Women uh, Hospital at uh, Harvard University. Uh, he's a great structural interventionist, is a co-director of uh, C3's uh, structural program. And now he's going to give us a U.S. perspective on sizing and valve choice for bicuspid uh, valve and TAVAR. Welcome, Pinak. Thank you, Raj. Uh, can you hear me okay? We hear you great. We see your slides great. Wonderful. Great. Uh, well, obviously, a lot of interest in bicuspid uh, uh, TAVR, particularly with uh, low risk being approved here in the United States. Uh, and I think as uh, Keith and others have pointed out, uh, as exciting as it is to have the low risk approval, many of our patients are going to be bicuspid in that, um, in that category. Uh, here we go. Uh, and I'm not going to belabor this, uh, but I think we're all familiar with the, uh, the types of bicuspid aortic valve. I was actually very interested to learn that they're seeing a lot more type zeros in China. Uh, that was not, I knew they saw more bicuspids in general, but I didn't realize such a high preference, uh, prevalence of type zeros where there's really only two leaflets and, um, and one um, uh, sort of commissure. Uh, most of what we're seeing here in the United States are the type ones. Uh, with fusion of two of the three cusps. And of course, most commonly we see the left-right fusion as being the more common. Uh, and then rarely we'll see patients who have a fusion uh, of, uh, two, of, of two separate commissures. Uh, and as pointed out, and this is a, for a classic uh, autopsy study from Roberts uh, many years ago, again, showing us that in the pink, we see the bicuspid valves. And as patients are younger, uh, certainly a higher prevalence of bicuspid uh, disease uh, in the younger patients presenting with significant aortic stenosis. So uh, as you've already heard, all randomized controlled trials uh, of TAVR uh, compared to SAVR excluded bicuspid aortic valves. And despite this, interestingly, the present FDA label does not necessarily specify that a valve must be tricuspid for consideration of TAVR. Um, and, and what it really does uh, suggest or uh, requires is that there has to be a careful heart team evaluation and consensus decision regarding whether TAVR is preferable for uh, SAVR. So I think many of us have taken this to suggest that uh, there isn't necessarily an exclusion of, of uh, TAVR for bicuspid aortic valves, but also not necessarily a wholehearted endorsement at this time. So what are some of the potential issues? I think we've already heard this uh, nicely from Dr. Wang, uh, but uh, a couple of things that we have to keep in mind, about 15% of our patients with bicuspid aortic valves will have thoracic aortic aneurysms. So of course, that is something that we cannot uh, uh, manage transcatheter, uh, particularly in a low-risk patient, probably best treated with surgery. Uh, there's often heavy, bulky calcification of the leaflets. Uh, the RAFE may be heavily calcified, and that's particularly important because it may uh, not actually give at the time that you are deploying your valve, uh, or if it does give, it may actually cause significant trauma all the way to the annulus, leading to annular injury. Oftentimes, the annulus is very large and ovoid, uh, so this may make for non-confirmation uh, of your new valve leading to paravalvular regurgitation or a non-circular deployment. Um, and these patients often have a horizontal aortic root, which can make uh, delivery of a transcatheter valve much more challenging. And uh, this is just uh, something I think we've all seen. Uh, this is a bicuspid aortic valve with right-left fusion and just heavy bulky calcification with a, a fused raft. 
uh, and a different valve here, but uh, again, a calcified RAF that uh, then underwent treat uh, treatment with a core valve device. And you can see here this non-circular deployment. Uh, and in two different views, we see very different um, uh, uh, senses of how well this valve is expanded. So of course, the concern here is that with this kind of deployment, we may have a situation where if there's abnormal flow patterns to the valve, it may lead to early leaflet uh, degeneration and poor durability. So where does the data, and some of this has already been touched on, um, this is actually one of the older studies. Um, actually, it's not that old, only three years ago, but, uh, but certainly uh, there's been much more data since this time. Uh, this is from the Cedars group, um, looking at um, uh, uh, TAVRs uh, performed at multiple centers. Not, it's not a TVT analysis, but really just a, a compilation of centers uh, comparing patients who underwent bicuspid uh, TAVR versus tricuspid TAVR. And this is a propensity matched analysis of 540. Patients. So, of course, these patients are going to be mostly the uh, higher risk patients, not a lot of low risk patients uh, in this particular study. And a couple of things that we're seeing here, and I think we all have learned to come to respect when we're doing tavern bicuspid valves. First of all, the likelihood of conversion to surgery uh, was much higher in the bicuspid group. Uh, the likelihood of aortic root injury uh, was higher. Uh, the need for multiple valves to obtain the result, the desired result, was higher, um, as well as the likelihood of leading a patient with moderate to severe paravalvular leak, which we would all agree is not really acceptable uh, in the modern era of TAVR. Uh, overall, device successes were lower in this, in this particular uh, study. And um, they did look at a cohort of patients who were treated with first-generation devices. So the first, uh, well, actually, Sapien XT is second generation, uh, but the first-generation core valve device. And what you can see is that in bicuspid versus tricuspid, uh, tricuspid being in blue, the outcomes were overall worse. So greater likelihood of conversion to surgery, need for a second valve, uh, incidence of moderate to severe paravalvular leak and absence of device success. Interestingly, uh, not a significant difference in pacemakers. When we now look in the same study to patients who received later generation devices, including Evolute R, Sapien 3, and Lotus, we see that the difference between the two, the overall numbers are less, and the difference between bicuspid and tricuspid is improved. So likely owing to uh, the fact that as we do more of these, we become better implanters and that our devices have gotten better in terms of deliverability and, um, and leak modification. Uh, so um, so a, a very good sign that we can get reasonable results in appropriately selected patients. If we look at all-cause mortality out to uh, two years, no significant difference in this particular study. Um, and um, uh, interesting, mortality was not that different as well uh, between tricuspid and bicuspid valves when we look at first-generation devices uh, and later-generation devices. If anything, perhaps a slight um, uh, 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 trend towards improved mortality. But overall, I think we can say that uh, in appropriately selected patients in this propensity match analysis, probably not a major um, difference. Uh, this study was already alluded to uh, in uh, two prior talks from, uh, again, from Raj Makar. Uh, we had an opportunity to participate in the study as well. This is using the TVT registry um, and uh, again, doing a propensity matched analysis uh, many more patients now in this particular analysis. Uh, and uh, as mentioned, there were, are some limitations uh, with uh, the TBT registry in terms of uh, the follow-up data not necessarily being consistent and being site reported, but at least uh, in this particular study with uh, over 2,600 patients in both arms, again, propensity uh, matched. The, uh, uh, when we look at annual rupture, again, we see that there are more annual ruptures in the bicuspid group. Very few, though, only seven, none in the tricuspid group, but I think, again, suggests that we have to respect this anatomy uh, um, uh, compared to what we may be dealing with in tricuspid anatomy. And when we look at other outcomes, this was already uh, pointed out, that stroke was higher. Uh, you know, my understanding from speaking to my surgical colleagues is that the, the calcifications that we typically see in bicuspid aortic valve are, are quite different than what we see in senile tricuspid stenosis and, and often very friable. Um, so it's not entirely surprising that we might have a higher incidence of stroke in bicuspid TAVR compared to tricuspid TAVR. Um, 
And when we look out to uh, two years, um, uh, actually after a year, I'm sorry, those were 30 day outcomes. When we look out to a year, overall, not a major or statistically significant difference in stroke or uh, mortality in bicuspid versus tricuspid valve. And again, these are all balloon expandable valves, the Sapien uh, platform. Um, so I think what we've learned, at least from these two prior analyses, is that we can, if we appropriately select our patients, get good outcomes. And that's the key point. Um, and this data was already uh, presented by uh, Guy and others uh, from the recently presented uh, low-risk bicuspid study of Evolute. So this is just a registry of uh, 150 patients and showing a good um, acceptable uh, death or disabling stroke uh, uh, number out to 30 days is 1.3 percent. These are low-risk patients, so I think that's an acceptable number. And when we look at the other things that we uh, are very concerned about, we see, again, acceptable numbers in terms of uh, a stroke, major vascular complications. Pacemaker rates continue to be perhaps higher than we would like to see and certainly going to be higher than what we would see in a patient undergoing surgery for bicuspid aortic valve. Uh, very low uh, coronary obstruction rates. Um, patient prosthesis mismatch does not appear to be a major concern uh, with the uh, Evolute R uh, in bicuspid patients. And uh, there's only two patients in the entire cohort who had a gradient, who were left with a gradient greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. Um, we see that uh, there is uh, probably uh, higher than we would like uh, incidence of mild paravalvular regurgitation. I think we're learning that perhaps even mild PVL is not going to be acceptable, particularly in low risk patients. So it's something that we have to be very careful about. One thing that I thought was very interesting, and I think is actually true in our own practice, I, I initially was much more concerned about doing TAVRs in patients with type zero bicuspid aortic valve, but I think in general, we're getting better results in type zero. And we certainly saw this in this particular uh, study uh, where there was a lower incidence of uh, mild PVL uh, with uh, type zero. Very good gradients uh, in effective orifice area. And again, looking at uh, the type zeros versus type one, there were very few type zeros in this study, as already pointed out, but we can get very good results with type zeros as well. Um, so I think the, the major issues with TAVR and bicuspid, uh, uh, aside from who's an appropriate candidate, uh, also comes down to some technical considerations. So of course, we're going to see some patients who are too high risk for surgery where they have a bicuspid aortic valve and we're going to have to treat them with TAVR and, and we have to take uh, certain uh, aspects of our technique uh, uh, a little bit differently than we uh, think about when we're dealing with a tricuspid patient. So first, where do we measure the annulus? Uh, how do we choose our valve size? Should we be routinely doing balloon aortic valvuloplasty? Should we consider a higher deployment? And does the prosthesis selection matter? So I'll just touch on each of these um, here. So in terms of optimal measurement location on MDCT, in terms of what value are we to use to pick our valve prosthesis size, um, so here we see this uh, uh, typical type one, uh, type one bicuspid with right left fusion. Uh, so a couple of potential areas of where we would make that measurement. One would be just typically at the annulus where we typically make our measurements in tricuspid aortic valve. Um, a second consideration is thinking about using a intercommissural distance uh, at about four millimeters above the annulus as your uh, uh, surrogate for what your valve diameter ought to be. And then third is actually making a measurement at that area. And again, the concern here is that if your RAFE is going to limit uh, uh, the expansion of the valve, you may not necessarily want to be sizing to the actual annulus as if, it's, if you're relatively oversized here, this may lead to a higher likelihood of rupture. So we're really trying to balance, trying to get the best valve hemodynamics and minimization of paravalvular regurgitation versus uh, avoiding a major complication uh, such as annular rupture, which of course can be uh, catastrophic. And I think it's safe to say that there's really consensus lacking on the best location for where you make this measurement. I think if we asked everybody on the panel today uh, or in the audience, we're probably gonna get an equal splay of answers in terms of what people use. I mean, I think in general, we all look at all three of these things. 
Uh, in my personal practice, I still tend to go more with the tried and true and or tracing, but perhaps it would, particularly on the borderline, think about going smaller rather than larger um, uh, to avoid some of the potential complications like annual or rupture. So then just coming to prosthesis size, I mean, I think we typically like to think about oversizing our tricuspid valves by five to 10%. Uh, but I think for bicuspids, I tend to, to, to back off on that, I think, as most people do. And uh, particularly in, in situations where you're dealing with a valve size that's right on the border of two different uh, potential choices, uh, in general, uh, I will, and I think most will consider undersizing, again, to avoid potential uh, trauma. What about BAV? I mean, most of us have moved away from BAV. Uh, all together for our tricuspid valves, but I, I think it still has a lot of value. We um, just heard uh, in our earlier talk this morning about the potential use for BAV uh, to help uh, sizing. Um, I, I like to use it uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is just to get a sense of how that RAFE is going to uh, respond when I put in a, a valve of uh, close to the same size. I typically try to do one-to-one -one sizing when I BAV, um, when I'm thinking about the type of the valve size I'm putting in. So I have a good uh, understanding of, of what my valve will look like. Uh, this actually is from a 90-year-old woman uh, who was actually quite active uh, and interestingly had a bicuspid aortic valve with a lot of bulky calcium. The other thing is just visualizing where that bulky calcium is going to go. She was not at particular high risk based on CT analysis of coronary obstruction, but you can see here uh, uh, the bulky uh, nature of this calcium and how close it gets to the sinus, as well as the fact that it just stays up after we put this balloon up. Of course, this woman became a little bit unstable with pretty significant AI after this, and we had to move quickly to get the valve in. So I do think it's helpful for, um, for uh, uh, visualizing how the RAFE is going to respond. Uh, it uh, helps you decide uh, on um, the appropriate valve size. I will tell you that this woman's valve annulus measured at around 556, which was a complete surprise. A nine-year-old woman who we, you know, we may be thinking about putting one of our larger prostheses in. We decided to go with the 26 millimeter ultra in this particular case. Um, I also can look at coronary filling uh, and, as I mentioned, responses to the, to the RAFE. Um, what about a higher deployment? Uh, so uh, some have advocated for a higher deployment to ensure that you get appropriate anchoring and sealing, particularly at the level of the RAFE. Um, uh, it may reduce pa pacemaker risk uh, from lack of, or reduction of interaction with the uh, LVOT. Uh, perhaps you'll get better bioprosthesis leaflet function, particularly with a superannular design uh, being away from uh, where the greater constriction of the, of the prosthesis may be. Uh, but it's important to ensure that at least your true annulus is also covered because in many cases you have to post dilate these valves and if you if you're too high you may end up risking having that valve move out of the annulus and then um, having to think about another device. Uh, so I think uh, in general uh, for all tavers now we're moving to higher deployment but it may be a consideration uh, especially for bicuspid aortic valves. And finally does prosthesis type matter and I think we can debate again uh, uh, which valve would be better. I think they all have their potential advantages and disadvantages for uh, bicuspid aortic valves. Um, again, in our practice, we tend to use the ultra uh, uh, most commonly uh, for bicuspid aortic valves. Um, uh, and I think it just has to do with our familiarity. I'm not necessarily going to tell you that this is the best device uh, for bicuspids. We do like the ceiling skirt. We do uh, uh, like the, the ability to flex the delivery system, which can be very helpful in particularly horizontal aortas. Uh, of course, the disadvantages, well, you get one shot with this thing. And what you get is what you get. So, uh, so you have to get it right. 
Um, and it is balloon expandable. So of course, with balloon expansion, you do worry about potential annular trauma. Of course, the, uh, the core valve devices have the advantage of, it, of at least being mostly repositionable and not requiring that balloon for delivery, which again is a major source of annular trauma. Uh, but uh, you may need that balloon anyway, because you will often have it to post dilate these valves to ensure that you minimize leak and get a good seal. And sometimes in very horizontal aortas, it can be a real challenge to deliver these valves uh, as you can't necessarily uh, flex the catheter. And of course, now we have the Lotus Edge, which is really only approved for the uh, high risk patients at this time, uh, has the advantage of being a fully repositionable, a very controlled slow deployment and this adaptive seal that virtually eliminate, eliminates uh, paravalvular leak. Uh, but it does have the disadvantages of uh, higher pacemaker rates and a slightly larger delivery system. Um, so to wrap up, uh, TAVR and bicuspid aortic valve is safe with excellent results, but in appropriately so selected patients. So I do think we have to take the data that we have out there with a grain of salt and understand, uh, particularly in our low risk patients, that uh, there are going to be patients who we just know we're not going to get a great result with a TAVR valve. And that can be a very difficult uh, conversation with uh, many of our low-risk patients because I'm sure as all of you are experiencing now, we have a lot of uh, late 50, early 60-year-olds coming in wanting a TAVR and wanting to avoid surgery. And, you know, you know you have to sit down and get ready for a long conversation about why that may not be the best uh, choice in that patient's case. Um, the technical considerations are different uh, compared to when performing TAVR and tricuspid aortic valves. Um, whether there is a clear advantage of one valve type over the others is not known at this time. I think many people have very strong opinions, but I think that's going to be a hard thing to prove. And finally, I think a, another question of debate is whether or not we're going to need a randomized controlled trial in low-risk patients. I mean, I think it would be extraordinarily uh, helpful to, to, to perform such a trial. I think it's going to be virtually impossible uh, because, uh, first of all, I'm not exactly sure how that trial would get funded. Uh, I would imagine the device companies have very little interest in funding such a trial at this point. Secondly, I, I think it's going to be uh, difficult for many of our patients to consider randomization, uh, particularly if they, they know they could potentially go somewhere else and get a TAVR outside of a trial. So um, I think it'll be an interesting uh, 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 debate to see whether or not this actually happens and whether it can actually get funded. And I will end there. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Pinak, for uh, that uh, wonderful presentation. We'll take one question. This is a question that comes from uh, Dr. Ren Gong in uh, China. Uh, and he states, uh, while size uh, choosing is a big difference uh, between China and US. Uh, in China, they like to use supraannular tracing. However, the evolute low risk BAV study uses annular sizing for all patients and the result seems to be good. Why and how should we choose? Yeah, I think that I think it's a good question. And like I said, I think that um, I think we have much more to learn on this. Um, I think it's a very difficult balance uh, with bicuspids to try to avoid uh, complications, but in doing so, we may be leaving patients with more, um, more leak or perhaps more non-circular uh, deployment uh, with our valves. So um, I, th I still think we have, have much more to learn. I, in, in our experience, and we've done a reasonable number of bicuspids, as I'm sure, if obviously you, you in China have done uh, far more than we have, and I know many people on the panel here, um, we have found that they, making the measurement at the annulus and going at the annulus, uh, picking our valve size based on the annular dimension, seems to have gotten us the best results in terms of leak uh, and circular deployment. Um, however, again, if we are in a situation where the, um, where the, um, uh, 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 the, uh, the valve is going to be on a borderline. At that point, we'll think about downsizing. But I, I think a comment was made earlier that uh, perhaps about 80% of the valves that uh, you're doing in China 
uh, for bicuspids tend to be more on the smaller or downsize. And I don't think that's necessarily how we're practicing here in the United States, but I do think we, uh, we have more to learn about this. And, and I'd be interested to hear uh, some of the other panel's comments on that. Okay, um, uh, we'll take one more question. This is a question from uh, Dr. Uh, Rajesh Karbanda uh, in the uh, UK. Uh, has uh, high implant height increased valve embolism rates in, um, in our uh, practice? Um, I mean, so I, I, I think it's, um... I think it's, it's valve embolization. Fortunately, is is pretty rare, uh, even in bicuspids. I think I showed you in the uh, in the Macar paper that there were only seven uh, embolizations out of the twenty six hundred patients. So it's pretty rare. Um, so whether or not we can show for sure that we've reduced embolization rates, I think is very difficult to say. But I would say that. Um, you know, again, I think you just have to be very judicious about how high you go, but uh, I, I can't honestly say that uh, implanting higher uh, as we've gotten more comfortable with the technique, even in tricuspids, has led to a higher uh, embolization rate. I, I would say that the things that would make me much more concerned about a potential valve embolization uh, would be, uh, first of all, if we are significantly undersized, I think that that's one potential consideration, particularly if you're dealing with a very, very large annulus, uh, which uh, uh, many of these patients can have, far larger than uh, the IFU of a lot of these valves will allow. Um, and then the other concern is if that if the RAFE doesn't necessarily give uh, when you are uh, deploying that valve and a, a watermelon seeds uh, out either ventricularly or aortic, then I think that's a concern as well. And that's why I think uh, a BAV is really important to get a sense of how that RAFE is going to respond uh, when you deploy the valve. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so we'll keep moving now. Uh, it's uh, again a uh, uh, great uh, uh, delight uh, to have Dr. Wai Lu, who as a a rising star uh, in uh, China and a right-hand person of Professor Zhao at Anzen uh, Hospital in Beijing. Uh, Anzen Hospital uh, is the second largest uh, interventional uh, uh, hospital in uh, China who does more than 10,000 uh, PCIs a year. Uh, Dr. Zhao uh, and uh, uh, Y uh, also uh, put together a five continent Congress as well as Great Wall Congress and I've had the privilege of being there many times. And they are great uh, collaborators uh, with the C3 and, and our future uh, our collaboration uh, with China. So uh, thanks, Y, uh, for, for taking such a huge effort to have thousands of uh, Chinese physicians attend this webinar today. Uh, and uh, uh, now Y is going to present our uh, last uh, uh, case uh, of the uh, session. Um, just to give you one uh, housekeeping announcement uh, from every Saturday uh, for next three weeks, we will have a webinar next Saturday, which is May 2nd. Uh, we'll be uh, talking about North American experience of COVID. Uh, on May 9th, uh, we'll have a webinar uh, from, uh, again, 8 to uh, 10 a.m. on PC optimization uh, with OCT and FFR. And then on May 16th, uh, we'll be back again with a, a structural heart session uh, part two. And I uh, look forward to seeing many of you again on, on some of this. So I'm gonna turn it over to Y now, uh, who's gonna talk about bicuspid uh, calcified aortic stenosis with horizontal aorta treated uh, by Venus plus valve. learnings from the global global expert in the Tiber. And we have a, 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 about a few thousand audience in the uh, listening to this webinar in China. Uh, it's really a great event. And today, I'm going to talk about the bicuspid uh, uh, calcified aortic stenosis uh, with horizontal aorta uh, treated by Venus Plus. And uh, this is a case performed by, uh, by Professor Zhou and me together. And as we mentioned today, the bicuspid is a very, bicuspid aortic valve is a very hot topic 
uh, because it's so unique uh, and also it's very unique in China as well. And uh, Professor uh, Wang uh, Jian Wang has spoken about his strategy uh, in selecting the valve and, and selecting the valve uh, for the bicuspid case. And uh, in this case, I'm going to illustrate, illustrate how we choose the valve and how we implanted the valve. And here is the case. And this is a 68 years old uh, female uh, with a diagnosis of uh, severe aortic stenosis. And uh, he has his uh, echocardiogram shows uh, uh, EF as uh, 61%. Uh, with a uh, jet velocity is uh, 5.6 millimeter per second. And um, his mean aortic valve gradient is uh, 75 millimeters of mercury. And the max uh, gradient is uh, 126. And uh, let's have a look of uh, his uh, her CT scan. And this is a view from uh, her annulars. Uh, you can see this um, size is 21.5 by 27 by 27 by 27.3, and the parameter is 77.1. And the diameters uh, derived from the parameter is 24.6. And the LVOT is 21.6 by 29.2. And the sinus of Osama is uh, 28.9 by 35.3. And the ELTA is uh, 41.8 by 42.9. And uh, we can see from here, the aortic root angulation is quite uh, horizontal. It, it's, uh, it is about 75 degree. And the uh, patient's valve is very calcified. Uh, the calcification like volume is uh, uh, more than 850. And from uh, the middle picture, we can see that it is a uh, type one aortic valve uh, with, the, uh, with the fusion of the uh, left cor coronary uh, cusp and also the right coronary cusp, and there's a, a rough here. And in the etiology of the bicuspid uh, valve uh, in China is uh, quite unique. Uh, some of the bicuspid is from the congenital, uh, but because uh, China has a lot of rheumatic patients, so maybe some of the uh, some of the bicuspid is pseudo bicuspid. Then it means uh, the patient actually has a rheumatic valve disease with fusion of the uh, of uh, two cusps. But uh, uh, but obviously the, this patient, the anatomy is uh, very hostile. Uh, he has she has a bicuspid valve and also has a horizontal aorta and also very calcified. Uh, Fortunately, uh, the patient, this, uh, the coronary height, coronary height is uh, optimal, it's uh, more than 10 millimeters. In the vessel, the peripheral vessel is also very, as well, also very good for as, uh, femoral exercise. And um, the valve we are going to use is the Venus A plus valve. The Venus A plus valve is similar to, it's the second generation of the Venus A valve. And the Venus A valve uh, is similar, very similar to American whole valve. Uh, just the difference is the uh, Venus valve is that the uh, radial force. Uh, the radial force is uh, a little bit higher uh, than the uh, than the metronic whole valve, and also also some of the little difference uh, between the design of Venus valve and the whole valve. And we can see that uh, for. Uh, uh, the minimum valve, uh, Venus, uh, Venus A valve, is uh, 23, and the largest is uh, 32. And there are 26 and 29 in the middle. And for the 26, uh, the diameters can be from 20 millimeters to 23 millimeters. And for 29, the diameters is from the 23 to 26. So how did we choose the valve size? Uh, we choose the valve size. Uh, actually, it's not from the annular, uh, as mentioned from uh, Dr. Go. The size of, we measure the size of bicuspid valve uh, by the supraannular. Uh, supraannular, this is at the valve level. Uh, so we always choose the size, uh, is, which is uh, smaller 
than the annular. So the annular, as you can remember, the annular is about 24. So uh, if we choose one size smaller than the annular, it will be fall on the 20 to 23. So initially, we think we may choose a, a 26 the size of valve. So if we want to confirm the size we choose is correct, we'll use a balloon to uh, we'll balloon we'll use the balloon to size. And and this is, is what we we are doing. Uh, that this is what we were doing. And after we uh, make the exercise, uh, we use a 22 millimeters balloon to size uh, to size this uh, valve. Uh, and we can see that by the inflation uh, of the 22 millimeter balloon, uh, there is no leakage. There's no leakage means that the balloon is not small. Uh, so because the balloon is a uh, 22, so we decided to use the valve uh, 20. Uh, 26 valve. Uh, this is the strategy of how we choose the valve for the bicuspid. Uh, we, we'll, we'll judge the size of the valve uh, either both from, both from the CT scan, uh, the measurement of CT scan, and from the balloon sizing. Uh, so from the measurement of the CT scan and the balloon sizing, we decided to use a 26 millimeter balloon. And don't forget, this patient have another, has another challenge. Uh, the challenge is the horizontal uh, aortic valve, horizontal uh, aorta, and also has the, uh, has very calcified. Uh, and uh, this venous A plus valve, uh, both venous A plus valve and the venous A valve has a very strong radio force. Uh, so this is why uh, it, it can be used for the Chinese patient with uh, high, very high calcification. Uh, so, and also for this venous plus valve, is the second generation of venous A. So this is a retrievable valve, yeah, uh, similar to the Avalute, uh, but uh, obviously has a uh, more radial valves than than the uh, Medtronic valve. So we present in a we present in a valve. Uh, a little bit. Uh, I think this is the this is the marker. This is the marker. This is also unique for the venous A valve or venous A plus valve. Uh, and we use this marker uh, get a, a good alignment with the bottom of the cusp. And so at this uh, position, uh, we decide we decided to move a little bit of valve. So we de deploy the valve a little bit. Uh, Higher than our euro position, uh, our euro position for the tricuspid valve. Uh, so this is the final, final uh, position. And we didn't. We use one time of the uh, valve retrieval uh, because this valve is, uh, can be retrieved. And also, you can see there's another actual line here, and this line is the snare uh, because this uh, horizontal. So we use the snare to location, relocation the direction of the valve to make it more alignment with, uh, with this aorta because it's so horizontal. And after all this, uh, all, all after all these measurements, uh, you can see that the valve deploy, deployed very well and just at the location we desire to deploy it. Uh, we desire to deploy uh, super annular and uh, higher than the euro position for, for we deploy the valve for the tricuspid uh, aorta. So uh, we finished the procedure. Uh, here is the final position for this uh, uh, this uh, tiver, uh, this uh, venous uh, A plus. Uh, you can see that the valve is very horizontal, and this location, the position is the valve. Is quite high uh, compared with uh, uh, with the euro position, and the echo result shows uh, uh, it's quite uh, optimal. Uh, the velocity uh, dropped from uh, about uh, seven millimeters to two point three millimeters uh, per second, and uh, the mean gradient uh, dropped to a single, uh, almost single digit level. And there's only a mild uh, pyrovalvular leak and uh, with uh, mild, uh, uh, mild regurgitation.
So the uh, whole message for our case is uh, the bicuspid valve and the horizontal aorta uh, is, uh, a, is a tough situation in the TAVR procedure. And since they are very strongly associated with complications, and uh, for our the strategy for us uh, in evaluating uh, the size of uh, the type we choose uh, is according to both the CT scan and uh, the balloon sizing. Uh, so and also uh, be familiar with the uh, intervention technique. Uh, especially the valve is very important, um, and in this case we use the Vena Venus A valve. Uh, has the advantage of retrievable and also has a good radio fast. Uh, this may uh, th this may give the possibility of uh, final success for our case. And uh, this is our uh, team, the whole team. And this is a Professor Joe, me, and uh, young fellows. And also we have a surgeon, Professor John Hyper here. Uh, Hyper uh, Professor John always uh, accompanying us for the procedure. Uh, thanks to you for your attention. Th th thank you very much, uh, Wai. Uh, it was a very uh, nice presentation. Uh, if any panel members have any questions about this case. It's an interesting wall. Obviously, we don't have this wall in US, but I really like uh, how the wall is uh, made, and especially the markers that is very helpful um, uh, in this type of situation. Uh, uh, nice wow. Okay, so with that, uh, if there are no questions, uh, I want to thank uh, all the faculty members in US as well as in China uh, who has taken uh, time out of their very busy schedule to be with us on the weekend for this uh, wonderful webinar, which is a collaboration between C3 and a five continent Congress, uh, Dr. Zhao, in such a late evening in China, is still with us. Uh, and now he will uh, say the final word if he would like uh, to thank uh, and uh, tell goodbye to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, the Chairman David, to uh, the uh, joint force to organize this. Uh, High level the platform, the COVID 19 will change the world. Maybe a virtual uh, Congress, virtual meeting to become a, uh, to our the new uh, platform, platform. So we needed to a uh, long time to fly, and uh, no different uh, time difference. Now Beijing and the time near to uh, midnight. So uh, I will speak to you. Uh, Show us uh, uh, is a wonderful lecture to so give uh, advanced uh, technique and uh, rich experience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I also want to thank uh, Dr. Jian and Wang and uh, Dr. Yong Jian Wu uh, to uh, co chair uh, this session. With this, uh, we uh, conclude this session. Uh, thank you, everyone. Have a good rest of the day. Uh, and uh, in China, everyone have a good night. Uh, and uh, uh, have a wonderful uh, rest of the weekend. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Thank bye you bye. very much. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.